2023 AANS Annual Scientific Meeting in Los Angeles, investigators of the Multicenter Adaptive Enriched Trial presented results supporting the superiority of minimally invasive NCORD mediated hematoma evacuation uh, within 24 hours, class well known over medical management in improving long term functional outcomes in these patients. Um, despite these recent advancements, post operative view bleeding continues to be a devastating long term um, complication uh, of. Uh, ICH evacuation, especially amongst those going evacuation at early time points. Um, so we sought to prospectively prognosticate the risk of rebleeding um, up to a month after evacuation in patients um, after surgical evacuation for ICH using presenting and operative characteristics. Um, if identified correctly, these patients could in turn benefit from frequent radiographic monitoring and appropriate risk management in the subacute postoperative period. We developed and prospectively applied a novel five-level intraoperative bleeding scale based on the one, the presence of active bleeding, in the uh, time to achieve hemostasis, and three, the method used to achieve hemostasis. Uh, the bleeding score ra ranged from one to five, with one indicating no active bleeding encountered in the cavity, and a score of five indicating irrigation and cauterization requiring at least one hour to achieve hemostasis. So here is a bleeding vessel in the center of the image. And as you can see, the um, irrigation with water alone is eventually able to achieve hemostasis. Uh, so this patient was assigned a bleeding score of two. Here is an actively bleeding vessel um, and same vessel from a different angle. Um, this vessel wasn't treated, was required more than just simple irrigation. Um, here you can see cauterization top center of the vessel, first set of cauterization doesn't achieve hemostasis as evidenced by the active wisps of blood. Um, the second round of cauterization in the top center. And this eventually achieves hemostasis with the lack of active wisps of blood in the final uh, walkthrough of the cavity. So we had 142 patients that were prospective of assigned the bleeding score. The most common score was a two, indicating uh, bleeding only requiring um, irrigation to achieve hemostasis. Uh, Preoperative hematoma volume, uh, co-presentation with IVH, and time for mictus evacuation were independently associated with increased bleeding score. Um, this is consistent with the patient-level meta-analysis of 5,000 non-surgical patients, which found that time from ictus, preoperative ICH volume, and oral antiplatelet or anticoagulant use were independent predictors of hemorrhage growth in non-surgical patients. Um, the meta-analysis also demonstrated that the first three hours after symptom onset had the steepest decline in um, probability of hemorrhage growth. We similarly found that the intracavitary bleeding score was greatest within the first four hours of the last well-known, uh, with an average bleeding score of 4.8, and that bleeding score normalized thereafter to a, an average of 2 to 3 um, from 4 to 32 hours after last well-known. Um, next, we... Uh, wanted to de demonstrate the prognostic value of the intracavity bleeding score for um, postoperative bleeding up to a month after surgery. Of the six patients that experienced uh, postoperative re-bleeding, five of them had an intracavity bleeding score of five, and one of them had an intracavity bleeding score of four. Um, this corresponds to receiver operating curve AUC of 0 0.93, which demonstrates outstanding discrimination in the bleeding score's ability to prognosticate postoperative re-bleeding. These are six patients who um, had uh, uh, sagittal CT scans of six patients with ICH. Um, Postoperative bleeding demonstrates most of them had successful debulking of the hematoma. And then recurrent ICH had CT demonstrates a recurrent hematoma at the same side of the initial hematoma um, and a median of 15 days uh, post evacuation. Uh, these patients had exceptionally poor outcomes with um, four of them deceased, one lost follow-up, and one developing Alzheimer's disease, indicating that early detection of uh, or prognosticating um, re-bleeding is of importance in this patient to achieve good outcomes in these patients. So in conclusion, um, intraoperative bleeding burden um, and its predictors are similar to those found in non-surgical cohorts. Um, our findings also support the utility of the intraoperative bleeding scale, which had an outstanding discrimination for postoperative bleeding with an ROC AUC of 0 0.93, um, specifically, bleeding score five may be uniquely used to select high risk patients for close monitoring in the subacute postoperative period, with these patients, with a third of these patients eventually developing re bleeding. Um, we hope to see this scale used in future clinical trials and eventually in clinical practice as minimally evasive evacuation for ICH continuing to gain um, evidence in the literature. Thank you. Thank Any you, Mohammed.
Do we have any questions? Okay, we'll move on to our next speaker, um, Dr. Ray Fang. Okay, thank you, Dr. Martin. Sorry, I'll be sharing my screen. Okay, everybody can see my screen? We can. Okay. Um, good morning. My name is Ray Feng. I'm a PGY5 neurosurgery resident at Sinai. And um, today I will talk, uh, be talking about my research on a quantitative volumetric MRI analysis of the immediate effect of meningioma embolization on tumor size and surrounding edema. Um, so no disclosures to talk about. Um, a little bit of background. As endovascular um, in techniques develop and more embolization materials um, come into use, the uh, practice of preemptively embolizing meningiomas before the patients undergo resection has become more and more common. Um, it, some people have found it to be an effective uh, surgical adjunct at reducing intraoperative bleeding as well as um, resection time. However, the effect of embolization on tumor size and the surrounding brain edema remain largely unknown. And again, um, it's unclear the time course of these possible um, changes and um, and um, the sub uh, and also some of the subacute long term effects. So, why do we care? Acute and significant increase in tumor swelling and a peritumoral brain edema um, can, uh, can bring se serious consequences to the patient. They're rare, but um, a patient can uh, develop acute symptoms and sometimes even requiring um, going to the OR urgently for decompression. Um, the rates of such phenomena in the literature ranges from 1% to 8%, and there's a lack of quantitative understanding and also what factors contribute to, the, um, to the, uh, this phenomenon. So that brings us to our objective, to investigate the effects of the embolization on tumor size and to uh, peritumoral brain edema within the immediate post-procedural um, period. So methods. We, um, we reviewed the medical records uh, of all patients who underwent MRI following to uh, embolization prior to res resection uh, from the time period of 2012 to 2022. Um, total, to, total tumor volume, um, enhancement volume, and surrounding brain edema of, um, of volume pre and post embolization were generated by using semi automated segmentation. Um, embolization extent and edema index were defined as, um, as shown on this slide. Of note, we decided to use our MRI quantification because it has shown to uh, have improved accuracy as well as reliability over the traditional single dimensional or two dimensional measurements. And this has been shown in several studies on neurosurgical uh, pathologies. So this is just an example of um, what we did in terms of segmentation. As you can see on the top row are tumors that are um, that uh, are to our MRIs of tumors before um, embolization, and on, in the bottom row is the same tumor post embolization. And the uh, the middle panel showing the green volume that we segmented of um, the, uh, the enhancing tumor, and uh, post embolization you can see there are um, areas of decrease and enhancement, and those are segmented out in, the, um, in this purple color. And also, uh, we segmented out the total volume, the peritumoral um, brain edema as well. So we included 28 patients um, in our retrospective uh, study. Of note, none of our patients develop any clinical concerns for acute tumor swelling um, or increased um, uh, intracranial pressure or peritumoral um, edema. Um, our mean embolization extent was 0.34 with a range of zero to um, 0.94. Uh, about a quarter of patients had a, a high extent of embolization, and um, about a quarter had a um, low extent, and the rest are in the middle. So to go to, over some of our results in more detail, um, the mean tumor size pre-embolization uh, did not differ uh, statistic, uh, significantly uh, compared to post-embolization, um, neither did the mean extent of midline shift. Um, there's about, a again, a quarter of patients had an increase in total uh, tumor volume, um, the rest had a slight uh, decrease, and um, about a quarter of patients had an increase in midline shifts, and the, the majority remained unchanged or had a decrease. 
the main pre-embolization edema index was, was 1.97. Um, Again, there was no statistical significant change to post-embolization. Um, however, we did know that the change in edema index was, um, uh, was um, not significantly correlated with embolization extent, but significantly um, correlated with uh, pre-embolization edema index. So for tumors that seconds. are... I'm sorry? 30 seconds. Oh, okay. So, uh, so for, pa uh, for patients who already had a large pre-embolization edema index, they did show an increase um, in uh, edema index post-embolization. Uh, again, we did not have a significant uh, finding between timing to MRI to timing to, um, uh, to timing of the embolization procedure. So um, this is the first study using quantitative volume metric analysis to uh, analyze um, uh, tumor swelling and brain edema um, pre and post embolization. In our uh, cohort, we did not find any direct correlation between timing to an imaging and changes in tumor characteristics. Our results um, does, su does suggest that tumor with large pre-embolization edema is at risk for in further increase in edema. However, we, um, we do acknowledge the caveat that we had a small cohort and future investigations with larger cohorts, as well as um, interval imaging at more and longer time points, will be able to be better characterize this phenomenon. Um, so this is uh, all the um, uh, students and the attendings who have assisted with this project. Um, Thank you, and I can take any questions. Do you have any questions? I, uh, sorry, I don't know if you could see my hand, Peter. Go ahead. I, I enjoyed your presentation, Rui. Can I ask, and you may have mentioned this, three questions. Um, was there a difference between male and female? Oh, we um we actually did not do that analysis, uh, Dr. Zadeh. Actually, actually, that's a that, that's a really good point. We can go back and look look at it. Yeah, we did not do uh, our analysis based on gender. <clears throat> and then, do you have the grade of the tumors? Yes, we do have the grade of the tumor, and there was no um there was no uh, significant difference. Um, do you it, find there's likely... a variation in embolization based on grade? Um, no, we did not find um, there's a correlation, but it may uh, it may be because we only ha had very few patients small. that, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we have a relatively small sample size. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to Alex Tavarian. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Alex Averajan. I am a rising fourth year medical student here at Mount Sinai, who has been on a research year for the last year under the mentorship of Dr. Fifi. I'm here today to talk about our experience with transgenous embolization of endogenous malformations using the pressure cooker technique. Uh, no relevant disclosures. Uh, as a brief overview, vanagil malformations are congenital arteriovenous malformations between the choroidal circulation to a persistent median presence of phallic vein of Markowski, which is the embryonic precursor to the vein of Galen. In infants, they typically present with hydrocephalus, seizures, developmental delays. The first line therapy for these malformations is endovascular embolization, which is primarily conducted via a transarterial or transvenous approach. And if left untreated, we find a 76.7% .7 mortality in symptomatic patients. State transarterial embolization is considered to be the gold standard for treating these malformations. In our own personal experience from 2010 to 2020, we closed about 80% of the malformations solely through transarterial embolization. Uh, Transarterial approaches offer the benefit of being safe, but offer some disadvantages as it can be difficult to access the malformation from an arterial approach, and they become progressively more difficult to embolize as the remaining feeders become difficult to catheterize and smaller in caliber. For this reason, we often utilize a final transvenous embolization to achieve closure. About 20% of our cases here at Mount Sinai have received a transvenous approach. The advantages, of course, is that it does offer a higher rate of closure by going directly to the vein, but have some disadvantages in that it's riskier. We have a higher rate of venous sinus outflow restriction, hemorrhage, subsequent neurologic deficits, and a higher mortality as reported in the literature. This has traditionally been performed by transvenous coiling, but not much innovation has been seen since the 1980s in this approach. So for this, 
the pressure cooker technique was developed as a alternative option. This was first described by Dr. Chapeau in 2014, in which two or three microcatheters are navigated to the vein by a transjugular access. We use coils and glue to inject uh, embolic material and under hypertension from one catheter, which creates a plug that traps the first catheter's tip. Within this entrapped area, onyx is then injected in the remaining one or two catheters to embolize. We see a high rate of occlusion with this, but we don't know how this technique compares against traditional transvenous approaches and how these patients fare clinically after closure of their malformations by the pressure cooker technique. So to provide an example patient, uh, here we have subtracted AP and lateral views of the right common carotid, demonstrating a banogale malformation supplied by numerous fistulous feeders from pericolosal branches and posterior cerebral arteries. The oral supply to the malformation is seen from branches of the bilateral, minimalingual, and tentorial arteries. The malformation drains integrate through the straight sinus, and drainage of the brain is through normal appearing cortical veins. Um, so here we go. So here, this is after five transarterial embolizations. We have subtracted AP and lateral views, again, of the right common carotid, demonstrating a reduced vein of gain malformation, now mainly supplied by the lateral perforators and the right lateral cortical arteries. Considering that the residual feeders were small in caliber, we elected to close this by a transvenous approach. So here, these x-rays demonstrate three microcatheters in place within the vein, you can see right over here. Uh, two of the microcatheters are used to inject onyx to include the distal superior and inferior feeders to this malformation, while the third microcatheter is used to place coils at the foot of the vein and then inject glue to create a plug which seals in the injection in case of any reflux of onyx. Here are uh, unsubtracted views of the embolic cast after embolization by pressure cooker. You can see a large amount of embolic material is placed in the vein during this procedure. And then here, Follow-up angiography through the left vertebral artery demonstrates a complete obliteration of the malformation without any evidence of further shunting. So what we reviewed were all patients with a vein again malformation who were cured through a transvenous approach by the pressure cooker from January 2020 onward. We identified cases between two different centers here at Mount Sinai Hospital and an Alfred Krupp Hospital in Essen, Germany. We reviewed their initial clinical presentation, the presentation at the time of their transvenous embolization, any clinical or angiographic outcomes and technical parameters of the procedure overall. You have one minute. And, mm -hmm. We identified 15 patients who had a cured a transvenous embolization. The remaining arterial feeders couldn't be catheterized safely, and these patients presented with a very high symptom burden, all of them hydrocephalus, 80% with congestive heart failure. This burden alleviated over time with, with transarterial embolizations. When we compared this against occlusion with transvenous coiling, we found that pressure cookers actually achieved a significantly greater degree of angiographic occlusion. We found uh, uh, all of our patients had a totally occluded malformation. Technical success was achieved in all of our patients. Three patients did experience a small post-procedure interventricular hemorrhage, which required a subsequent ETV or EVD placement, but no hemorrhage source identified, and all three patients recovered without any deficit. And on long-term follow-up, 11 out of 15 patients who have received angiography for follow-up did confirm long-term cure of their malformation. We also identified all of our patients either be asymptomatic or have improvement in their symptoms, which we identify here as progression of milestones or reduced therapy needs, and our patients have been able to live normal interactive lives. Here's one of the cases seen in Essen. Again, you can see the large amount of embolic material in the cast, along with a resolution on the hamburger. So overall, the timing for deciding when to utilize the transient embolization is critical, as the remaining arterial feeders can represent safe routes for arterial approaches. Maximizing effectiveness of the transarterial embolization prior to venous approaches does minimize the risk of complications. Uh, we do note a lack of rupture and major hemorrhage with a pressure cooker compared to coiling, which has a 20% rate of poor outcomes in the literature. No permanent morbidity or mortality was occurred with this approach. And one neurosurgical consideration of note is that a large amount of bulk material is placed in the vein, which can increase the risk of obstructive hydrocephalus. We did see this as a possible concern in one of our patients who required an ETV after leaving the hospital postoperatively, but we did not find any evidence of venous hypertension or clinical symptoms associated. So overall, this is an attractive option. We find a high degree of occlusion, and these patients demonstrate persistent cure with an excellent clinical outcome, even at long-term clinical follow-up. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alex. Do we have any questions? see a hand raised. Sorry, Alex, it's uh, me again. <laughs> That's an interesting study. Can I ask, uh, again, you may have mentioned this, but this requires uh, ethics approval or do you proceed with, how do you decide one over the other technique? For a transarterial versus a transvenous approach, you mean? Yes. So typically um, with a transarterial approach, as the feeders get smaller and smaller in caliber, um, the possibility of catheterizing by an arterial approach is still an option, but 
Uh, mm -hmm. Many of these mal malformations develop a significant degree of angiogenesis, which really complicates the ability to achieve forward perfusion of embolic material to actually reach the malformation. And you know, trying to be too aggressive from an arterial approach can lead to uh, concern of actually- Alex, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's not the question, but so we basically have been given the trust of the ethics board here that um, it's a clinical decision discussed with the I family. See. Yeah. Um, Jeff, Alex, the other to... question I was going to I was going to ask was uh, what was the denominator? You had fifteen patients. How many patients were treated with vein of Galen malformations during this period? During this specific period, we treated around thirty patients overall. We've been electing more recently to opt for this transvenous approach due to its effectiveness. Um, oh yeah. So over the larger cohort, we had about. I think you should include that in your in your paper. You know what were this. Mm -hmm. What were the selection criteria? How many, you know, how many? So 50% is a huge number. Joanne, is that does that comport with your recent experience? I think it's more probably it will in this period there were 87 vein of gallon yeah. patients treated. Um, but more recently we've been um as we under as we begin to see patients who we've left with a little bit, and and Dr. Berenstein sitting next to me can comment, we have been seeing patients coming back in adulthood with significant issues. There, the malformation. If you leave a little bit, it comes back, and they have significant cognitive uh, issues because of venous hypertension. Um, they develop. Uh, they tend to develop sigmoid jugular stenosis or occlusion, and then everything starts draining uh, retrograde, and then they're developing um, visual issues, ICP issues. And so we've begun over the last few years to be a little bit more aggressive um, and, and trying to close, if there's a little shunt left, to try to close transvenously. Um, so that's, that's, that's been our approach recently. Well, we have to move on for time, but we'll... Maybe we'll bring that back as another discussion in Grand Rounds in the future. Um, we'll move on to Dr. Carr, who's uh, presenting a paper that he did with Dr. Rundrakun. Um, morning. All right. Uh, so I'm presenting on our uh, single institution series of patients with thoracoid arachnoid system webs under Dr. Rimpoon, as uh, Dr. Morgan said. We have no disclosures. Um, as a quick background, um, spinal arachnoid cysts and webs are intradural extramedullary membranes, which can form constrictive bands and cysts and cause pathologic mass effect and deformity on the spinal cord. And the amount of uh, webbing can range from just mild indentation to full spinal cord compression or uh, syngomyelia. And symptoms are often those of myelopathy, and in those patients, uh, in those patients, they may benefit from surgical resection. And here are some radiographic and uh, interoperative images of what these uh, cysts and webs look like. Um, these are rare entities that are infrequently studied in the literature, and there's little long-term data that exists about their natural history, um, surgical indications, and the overall prognosis of these patients. They're thought to arise uh, embryologically from this septum posticum, this posterior arachnoid membrane in the thoracic spine. The objective of our study was to look at our 10-year single institution database or a single health system database uh, to establish natural history and outcomes following surgical resection of these uh, arachnoid cysts and webs to help guide surgical decision-making. And secondarily, we wanted to help establish a radiographic grading system of these cysts and webs. Um, so we queried our health system radiology database uh, for terms uh, related to arachnoid cysts and webs or often in the differential. Uh, we also looked into individual surgeon case logs um, to try to find uh, patients who were operated on with these pathologies uh, in a 10-year period. Um, here's again uh, imaging of what these uh, cysts and webs look like on both CT myelogram and uh, MRI. And this also slide also goes to show um, something which is often the differential radiologically uh, of transdural spinal cord herniation just to differentiate um, how this looks different radiographically from a, the classic scalpel sign that you see. Uh, so in total, we found 127 patients in Mount Sinai uh, Health System who were found to have uh, arachnoid cysts and webs um, total radi uh, radiologically. And of those 41, so 32% underwent uh, surgical fenestration. 
with a mean age at diagnosis of 58, slight male predominance. And then uh, we characterize these cysts on a grading system of uh, one, two, three, uh, with type one cysts we define as just causing spinal cord deformity. This is a slight majority of all patients. Type two, in addition to spinal cord deformity, also presented with myelomalacia on MRI. And type three, the uh, smallest number, had a uh, steering formation, syringomyelia, in addition to uh, deformity. And so here's uh, some examples of each of those. Uh, with type one, you just see the classic scalpel sign, but no myelomalacia or syringomyelia. Uh, type two, you again see uh, indentation and spinal cord compression. And here you do see some myelomalacia. As a result, in type three, you see uh, syrinx forming. Uh, we found these to be centered primarily in the upper mid thoracic spine at around T4, uh, 22%, uh, which is uh, in keeping with another uh, large study in the literature that found about T5, I think, as the most common location. Uh, all 41 cases underwent surgery uh, were treated posteriorly with uh, a laminectomy or some sort of posterior decompression and intradural exploration to treat the pathology. Uh, six of our patients, 15%, underwent a hemilaminectomy. Uh, one patient had a laminoplasty, and two patients underwent uh, instrumented fusion in addition to laminectomy. Uh, the indications for surgery preoperatively were most commonly uh, those of thoracic myelopathy and gait imbalance, uh, lumbar extremity radiculopathy, and or thoracic back pain. Uh, symptoms improved and resolved in the vast majority of patients with an average length of follow-up of uh, 21 months, just under two years. Uh, in the literature, Pathologically, histologically, these are described as benign fibrous connective tissue. However, in our series, we saw a little more variety in the pathological findings. We had a total of 27 pathology specimens, of which two thirds showed the benign fibrous connective tissue. However, one third um, showed additional findings as well, uh, with about a quarter showing hyalinization and bone formation, as seen here. This is from our actual pathology database. Uh, and two patients showed inflammation uh, on pathology. Um, so this indicates that there might be an active process of inflammation that forms from these tissues, um, which, is, which uh, deserves more study, we think. Um, so in conclusion, um, we have a you know, large case series relative to the paucity of cases in the literature of arachnoid cysts and webs that are both uh, conservatively and surgically managed at our health system. Um, showing that the majority of patients do not require surgery, but those that do can benefit greatly from surgical decompression. However, with all the limitations that come with this, you know, single institution series um, with a small sample size and retrospective data. Um, this was a team effort, so thank you to everyone in the department and then neuropathology and neuroradiology who assisted with this project so far. And I'll open up any questions. Do you have any questions? Okay, then we'll move on to our next presenter, Christina Rosito, who was mentored by Dr. Kellner. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Christina Rosito. I'm a scholarly year student applying into neurosurgery this fall. Um, and today I will be sharing our findings assessing virtual reality as a way to teach EVD placement with medical students and residents. Here are our disclosures. So as everybody on the call knows, um, EVD placement is a foundational neurosurgical procedure that can have a high complication rate with both residents and attendings. Last week, Trevor touched on some of those complications that can occur with EBD placement. Um, and studies have shown that surgical experience can correlate, increased surgical experience can correlate with decreased intraoperative complications. So given the value of repetition in training, many attempts have been made to create training simulations for EBD placement. These simulations have ranged from simple Jello models to high-tech virtual reality simulations like the one shown on the right. Given this, we aimed to utilize the surgical theater virtual reality simulation to create an EVD training model. We aimed to characterize the learning curve for EVD placement in virtual reality with novice medical students. 
and then to validate these findings against neurosurgical resident performance. So we had medical students perform three EBD placements using virtual reality. We measured the distance from the tip of the catheter to the foramen of Monroe, and we also recorded the gross location of the catheter. We administered a survey before the simulation and after the simulation to the medical students, and then we validated these findings by having residents place EVDs in virtual reality and giving the survey to them as well. Here's an image showing the distance from the catheter to the foramen of Monroe and how we measured these catheter placements with the medical students, as well as how we categorized the gross location of the catheter. Overall, we had 21 medical students participate and eight residents participate. We found over time that the medical student performance improved over the three trials. Um, from trial one, the distance from the catheter to the foramen was 15 millimeters, and that significantly improved to 9.7 millimeters by the third trial. When we compared this to the residents, we found the residents uh, performed better and showed less variation in their placements. Um, and they were significantly better than the medical students by the first two trials. But by the third trial, the medical students caught up to the resident performance and there was no significant difference in the distance. Also with respect to the catheter location in the ventricle, we found that the medical students improved over time. Comparing this to the residents, again, the residents showed less variation and had high performance with location to the ventricle. Um, but again, the medical students caught up to the residents by the third trial. Looking at our survey results, we found that the medical student attitudes towards virtual reality significantly improved after the simulations um, with regards to utility overall, um, the importance of virtual reality training in resident curriculum, and the potential for um, skill development through virtual reality. However, when we administered the survey to the residents, um, they were significantly more neutral to negative on a couple of aspects of the simulation particularly the fidelity of the simulation compared to practice in the operating room, um, as well as the specifically the instrument movement within the simulation and the haptic feedback within the simulation. However, they did provide positive um, feedback regarding the potential use of VR in resident curriculum and for, for patient consent. So overall, virtual reality simulations may bridge the gap in training by enabling repeated practice in certain neurosurgical procedures, but further work is needed to improve the fidelity of these virtual reality models. This is the first time that the surgical theater VR simulation has been used in this way. In conclusion, virtual reality simulations may be an effective way to streamline training for neurosurgical procedures and serve as an important tool in promoting health literacy and education. So special thanks to the medical students and residents who participated in this trial. Christina, do you foresee any other applications for this aside from EVD placement, maybe simulating other procedures uh, or operating room technique? Definitely. I think that um, really any procedure could be reviewed using virtual reality. I know that a lot of the attendings will practice their cases in virtual reality to better understand the anatomy before going into the operating room. And so because the, the system is available to us, I think that it could definitely be applied to residents as well to, to better understand the anatomy and steps before going into the OR. Any other questions for Christina? Okay, and that will move on to Alejandro's presentation. He was mentored by Dr. Shrivastava. Thank you. Thanks for a great morning so far. And thank you to Dr. Zade for her inspiring lecture. Um, I'm sharing my screen. I'll go in presentation mode. Four. Let me go to... Four center mode. Um, so I'm going to talk about our work with KRE1 malformations with my mentor is Dr. Shrivastava. We'll talk about two um, 
projects a retrospective morphometric analysis and a prospective measurement of hind, hind brain motion in Chiari 1 patients. Uh, no disclosures or conflicts of interest to disclose, but um, I do want to mention, of course, that this work was done in close collaboration with the lab of Dr. Mehmet Kurt, who was at the Biomedical uh, in, in Engineering and Imaging Institute at Mount Sinai, but now is at the University of Washington. Um, we'll start with our work on morphometric and volumetric analysis of posterior cranial fossa in Chiari 1 malformation. So as way of introduction, Chiari 1 is classically um, characterized by at least three to five millimeters of tonsillar ectopia beyond the frame and magnum. However, uh, an estimated 15 to 30% of patients with radiographic tonsillar ectopia do not manifest any clinical symptoms. Additionally, this is the spectrum of um, Chiari malformations as they're currently classified. And this entity termed Chiari zero is more and more commonly recognized where there is no tonsillar ectopia at all. There is displacement of the, of the medulla and oftentimes uh, syringomyelia formation with symptomatology. So altogether, this points at um, perhaps additional underlying causes to the uh, symptomatology found in Chiari 1 malformations. Um, so with IRB approval, we retrospectively reviewed a total of 72 adult patients with Chiari 1 diagnoses who had undergone volumetric brain imaging. Um, and we compared this to 26 healthy adult volunteers that were aged matched. Uh, we analyzed multidimensional morphometric and volumetric features in their posterior cranial fossa Using uh, a number of software, uh, we analyzed both one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional um, characteristics in their posterior cranial fossa in a semi-automated fashion. Um, a, a number of features that will be important to um, define are, one, um, the areas that we defined as here, label number two, cer cervical medullary junction, label number three, the, ton the, tonsil, uh, the tonsils through the frame and magnum, and then labeled as number four is the frame and magnum. Well, we combined number two and number three um, and divided that by the total area of the frame and magnum. And we termed this the neural tissue ratio at the frame and magnum as a way to um, identify how much neural tissue was within the space. Additionally, two angles to define are the frame and magnum angle, uh, formed between the clivus and the occipital bone and the occipital angle formed by the tentorium and the occipital bone. In our analysis of one and two dimensional um, variables, we found that tonsillar herniation length uh, was longer in Chiari 1 patients as might be expected, but also the occipital angle was greater. Um, perhaps this points to a low lying torcula uh, in Chiari 1 patients. Um, there was greater surface area of the frame and magnum, surprisingly, in Chiari 1 patients, but off note, the neural tissue ratio, as we defined it, was greater uh, in Chiari 1 patients. When we looked at three-dimensional uh, analysis, we found that, uh, if, if I can bring your attention to B, the uh, tonsillar volume was greater in the Chiari 1 patients. However, the cerebellar volume, fourth ventricular volume, and the brainstem volume was significantly decreased in Chiari 1 patients. And so we see that um, there is a, a larger tonsillar volume and perhaps the displacement and compression on other posterior fossa structures cause these um, other significant findings. We further looked at a subset of One patients minute. with syringomyelia. Um, but only 10, we've identified 10 patients with syringomyelia, but we were limited to just uh, evaluating the upper cervical spine on brain MRI. Uh, there was no significantly, uh, statistically significant variable, but we, when we use logistic regression, we found that combining the neural tissue ratio, fourth ventricular volume and cerebellar volume, then the area under the curve reached over 0 0.9. And then we also looked at Chiari 1 patients who underwent surgery. 22 of our patients underwent surgery at our institution, and we found that the neural tissue ratio at the frame and magnum was clinically uh, greater, significantly greater in our Chiari 1 patients. So a few important limitations, the retrospective design and uh, the heterogeneity of our documentation, looking back at the records, but 
Our study supports global craniometric changes part of CM1 pathophysiology, and it uh, demonstrates that tissue ratio at the foramen magnum may be more directly linked with the subset of patients who undergo surgery than just the classic definition of tonsillar herniation alone. Um, and our study suggests that perhaps a more global um, uh, compression in the posterior cranial fossa leads to syringomyelia. So I'll stop there um, and uh, I'll see if there are any questions. This is great. Oh, go ahead. Great. Oh, great talk, Alejandro. That was that was awesome work. Um, I just had one question. Um, uh, when you were looking at things like the occipital angle and some of the other um, uh, figures there, it looked like there was a bimodal distribution between the Chiari and in the healthy patients. Um, and I'm just wondering if you saw anything in, in the, the demographics of the patients, whether that's maybe, you know, sex or um, something else that could account for some of that, that, that bimodal distribution that y'all saw. Yeah, good question, Trevor. In terms of gender, um, our, our study did have uh, more female Chiari 1 patients, but and that's um, consistent with the prevalence of Chiari 1 being found more commonly in female patients. Um, however, in terms of in terms of this bimodal distribution, uh, we did not see a um, significant uh, trend in those that had smaller or greater occipital angles. Great question, Chris. Yeah, Alejandro, very interesting. Um, can you elaborate on potential mechanisms for decreased brain volume in the cerebellum and brainstem in Chiari one? I, I think that seems yeah. like a, a very interesting finding. Absolutely. Um, very interestingly, Chiari 1 has been um, described in the past to have smaller posterior fossa volumes altogether. Um, I think I, I briefly mentioned it here in um, the, the intro slide. Um, Chiari 1 has been found to have smaller posterior fossa volumes as well as a shortened clivus. Um, and however, those findings in the past have not led to a significant impact on clinical management. And we attempted to do a broader uh, analysis of um, posterior cranial fossa structures in order to further um, delineate and elucidate pathophysiology and perhaps um, characteristics that might guide us in our management of the patients. If I can just make one, if I can just make one comment too, just. You know, this is really step one of understanding the complex physiology at the posterior fossa, just because there's anatomic variability, there's structural, you know, morphologic change that Alejandro describes, but there's real time motion that's occurring too. And the motion effects are compressive in nature. And I think that's going to really give us a better understanding of this kind of physiology. And that's really been our next study is really looking at the dynamic nature in in um, on MRI sequencing and seeing if we can quantify that motion. No, so thank you. Okay, we'll move on to Dr. Hardigan's talk. He was mentored by Dr. Swirsky and Dr. Mako. Thank you, is it uh, showing up in presenter mode, yes. Dr. Yeah. Morrison? Okay, great, go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks, everybody. I'm going to be presenting on um, our work today looking at uh, interleukin-3 and the post-stroke hematopoietic and inflammatory response in mice. So our lab has previously published um, on ischemic stroke um, and how that activates the hematopoietic bone marrow stem cells, namely looking at uh, LKS uh, cell population and, and that this increase in hematopoietic uh, stem cells and the LKS population was related to the overall size of the infarct correlating nicely here as seen on the right. We've also shown in other projects in our lab that were published um, in uh, JX Med and, and Science looking at um, how interleukin-3, which is a, a, a less uh, well-characterized uh, interleukin compared to ones like IL-1, uh, is critically involved in hematopoiesis, um, both in immune states like myocarditis as well as um, in sepsis. So we hypothesized that ischemic stroke would be dependent, um, uh, ischemic stroke uh, dependent bone marrow hematopoiesis and leukocyte generation would be IL-3 dependent, 
which would increase uh, inflammatory recruitment and regulate activity um, in the post uh, post stroke brain. So I took uh, mice, uh, both wild type and IL three global knockout mice, um, performed a middle cerebral artery occlusion model, and then we um, assessed them uh, seventy two hours later, uh, looking at um, uh, the inflammatory response. So these are our, you know uh, a characterization of our our gating strategies for both bone marrow, blood and brain, which were used to identify the inflammatory process and, and cellular cascade post-stroke. Importantly, what we identified was that IL-3 knockout does not impact the acute period uh, of uh, post-stroke hematopoietic or inflammatory responses either in the bone marrow. We, we weren't really seeing a lot of changes um, in our stroke, uh, stroke animals in uh, inflammatory monocytes in, in the LKS cells, although there was some, some increase as we had seen before. Um, certainly didn't see any changes in blood. And we did notice importantly here in the brain that we had a very nice uh, stroke response in terms of the inflammatory cellular population on the ipsilateral or ischemic hemisphere as seen in red compared to the contralateral hemisphere seen in blue. So we saw increases in leukocyte number, neutrophils, uh, no changes in the microglia in the acute time period, but we did see uh, high numbers of anti or uh, pro-inflammatory monocytes. So we recently published in the lab, uh, again, looking at how interleukin-3 is actually critically involved in chronic neurodegenerative disease states, such as Alzheimer's and, and MS, and that it was a critical regulator of microglial activity and migration uh, in these disease states. So we wanted to look now at a chronic uh, recovery phase uh, from stroke. So again, doing the same models with the control and, and IL-3 knockout mice, we performed uh, behavioral assessments, MRI, and then downstream inflammatory uh, profiling. We used for our neurological function a modification of Dr. Bederson's uh, originally proposed uh, neurological scoring for middle cerebral artery occlusion models uh, that incorporates um, death of the animals uh, given the long time frame. Uh, two weeks out in the mice, we wanted to make sure that we incorporated that endpoint. And what we showed was that the IL-3 knockout mice actually had a significantly worsened post-stroke neurological function and survival. As you can see here, at our earlier time point that we had been looking at, there really hadn't been that much separation, but as we started to draw out you know, over past a week, um, we noted that the, the survival of the uh, IL-3 knockout mice had worsened. And then once they reached a, about a week out, they stabilized um, both in terms of their survival and also their neurological function as seen here where they had a worsened neurological function score in blue. So we performed MRI on these mice at that time point. And importantly, we were able to demonstrate that at this chronic time point that the, the IL-3 knockout mice had larger infarct sizes and that this larger infarct size compared to the wild type mice correlated nicely with the neurological function that we see. This is a representative nine Tesla MRI that we performed on the mice where we can characterize the overall ischemic um, ischemic core and uh, volume. 30 second. We showed that in the IL-3 knockout mice that they exhibit a decreased microglia and uh, patrolling anti-inflammatory monocytes at this time point suggested that they have uh, not been able to recover to the same degree as the wild type mice and that their anti-inflammatory and uh, repair methods have been, have been damaged. And you can see a nice uh, ischemia uh, on the hemisphere there. This also correlated with a complete depression of bone marrow hematopoiesis um, and, and recovery um, of that during the chronic phase of stroke, both in bone marrow uh, seen here with overall leukocytes and this correlated with the blood as we would expect. So IL-3 is a critical regulator of hematopoiesis in the chronic phase of post-stroke inflammation. It increases infarct burden um, and when you knock it out and worsens their neurological function and survival post-stroke. And it alters resident and recluded uh, inflammatory cell populations in the ischemic brain without importantly altering the total leukocyte count. So I'd like to thank the members of my lab, thank our program leadership for supporting me um, as I uh, undertook this uh, NREF uh, fellowship this year. And also I'd like to thank the NREF uh, for um, the, the funding uh, opportunity. Uh, thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Trevor, this is, I think, really fantastic work. I'm pretty dumbfounded at the amount that you've been able to accomplish in this time. That's really, really great. I think, um, you know, there's, there's a fair amount of literature and the value of hematopoietic progenitors in the support. So I guess one of my questions is how much do you think 
the effects that you're seeing are mediated by um, mediation of more of the acute subacute inflammatory response, which has been shown to be detrimental is also, also in stroke versus the longer term recovery and reconstitution through progenitor cell activity. Yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a great question, Dr. Mako. And, and thank you. Um, yeah, I think similar to what we're seeing in some of the other disease states and processes, um, the ability to switch over from that pro-inflammatory early state um, to the anti-inflammatory state is, I think, what what we're starting to see. So we're we're doing a lot of immunohistochemistry work now, looking at how the microglia are able to migrate into the core of the infarct um, and how that is very likely IL three dependent. Um, so that migration into the core, um, you know, it's it's hard to characterize early on. Um, uh, in that very, very acute time point, we aren't seeing a lot of changes in the, the population counts of the microglia early, but the spatial differences, I think is where we're going to see, you know, how that is being impacted. And that bears out when we actually start to then look long, long term. And you can actually see as those populations really are, are separating in the, uh, ischemic tissue. Um, but you know, that's a great question. Dr. Zadi. Yeah, thank you, uh, Trevor. I see why you got an NREF. Congratulations. Um, thank you. You know, it's interesting because you see IL-3 come up in cancer and as you showed neurodegeneration, et cetera. I imagine if you did the same for trauma model, you would see the same. And I, I don't know that anybody knows the answer, but based on your knowledge, where do you think the differences come between different disease states? So let's say try to target uh, one of the ILs uh, and GBM, it failed. But where do you think um, the distinction in its role comes in different pathologies? Maybe it's a tough question, but just- No, it's, it's a great you know question. Area very well. I think that, you know, what I would look at is the Alzheimer's model that, are, uh, that we just published on within the last year. And I think that that is, um, I think probably our best indication of, of how- IL-3 is really working. And as I said, you know, what they showed was that it, it doesn't alter the microglial um, cells ability to, in that case, um, uh, degrade the amyloid plaques that they were localizing to, but that IL-3 is, is what is really driving uh, inflammatory cell migration and, and honing to areas of chronic disease. And so I think that what's nice about the stroke model is it's actually really the first one that we've shown that's really like a hyper acute injury. So TBI, I agree, would be a really interesting one to look at compared, you know, to what we have looked at, which would be MS, a chronic model, Alzheimer's, another chronic model. But I think the, the, maybe more than being different, the linking thread between these is just how important IL-3 is in a, a honing mechanism for the inflammatory cells. And I, that's, that's where I think that we sh we are and we should be focusing our efforts. Very nice, thank you. I'm afraid we have to move on for time, but Trevor, we will be having you present your um, academic time work over the in, in a few months and grand rounds. So we'll have more opportunities to ask you questions. Um, our next presenter is Janina Hernandez Marquez, who is mentored by Dr. Germano. Can I just ask Peter if you're not going to do it for each? person presenting to let us know your level of training and your relationship to the department. Jeannie, I think you're still on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Janina Hernandez Marquez. I'm a rising fourth year medical student and I'm one of the research scholars at the neurosurgery department. Uh, today, I will be talking about the validation of an artificial intelligence software for longitudinal assessment of high grade glioma tumors. Treatment, I'm sorry. As most of us know, high grade gliomas are very aggressive tumors that require close monitoring of their radiographic treatment response to differentiate between progression and pseudoprogression. Their longitudinal follow-up has been previously done using expert subjective rating adhering to the response assessment in neuro-oncology criteria 
otherwise known as the RANO criteria. And so machine learning success, including deep learning and artificial intelligence have recently been the source of research on automated tumor segmentation tools. Thus, the aim of our study was to validate the use of an FDA approved AI software for monitoring high-grade cle gliomas treatment response. The RANO criteria is based on bi-dimensional measurements, whereas the modified RANO criteria uses three-dimensional measurements. Both of these measurements have been previously um, calculated by neuroradiologists, whereas now we have these softwares that are able to automatically calculate such volumes. And both criteria take into consideration the enhancement, enhancing disease, the rising of new lesions, the a change in corticosteroid dosage, as well as the clinical status. And when all of these are factored in, you can assign a state of disease, whether it's complete response, partial response, stable disease, or progressive disease. For the methodology, we used a publicly available glioblastoma data set of MRIs from which we extracted subjects with the MRI parameters that were compatible to the FDA approved software. The analysis included T1 with contrast and flare images, and the volumes that were analyzed were for tumor burden, edema, and necrosis. And these were compared to volumes calculated by another um, software. And such were analyzed utilizing the modified Rano criteria. Further on, a statistical analysis was performed. For the results, we were able to extract 416 MRI data points belonging to 24 subjects. At the bottom, you can see um, a screenshot of what the software is able to depict for us. And it's able to show delineation of the different uh, components of the tumor. In red, we can see the enhancement. In yellow, necrosis. And in blue, the edema. And from the left to the right, the four sequences are showed, T1, T1 with contrast, T2, and flare. The software also depicts various views, axial, coronal, three-dimensional, and uh, sagittal views. And on the right side, you can see a graph where it shows the different um, time points and the overlap that occurs between the components of the tumor across. It's also able to give us a report showing the imaging, the change in volume across time, and the percentage change um, from the different sequences, which can be factored in with the clinical um, components. And with, the, with them, we can um, assign either RANO criteria or a modified RANO criteria. And so for our results, we did not find any significant difference between the volumes of edema from the flare imaging or the necrosis based on T1 with contrast, comparing both softwares. Yet we did find a difference between uh, tumor burden measurements based on T1 with contrast. And from those differences, uh, 20 discrepancies were observed, resulting in a change in the modified RANO allocation. When, apologies, uh, when those discrepancies were further analyzed, if we observed that if the post-op MRI was removed, no differences were found. And so um, this post-op MRI seems to be more complex as previous literature has mentioned because it contains post-surgical changes such as blood products or increased vascular permeability. And thus it probably needs further refinements in terms of the software to increase its accuracy. But right now we're uh, conducting an investigator blind comparison to address such discrepancies. And to conclude, our results corroborate the role of artificial intelligence in facilitating a more accurate differential diagnosis between tumor progression and pseudoprogression. Um, and we believe that further studies are needed to utilizing perspective data to corroborate such results. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanina. Do we have any questions? Dr. Zadek? Yeah, Nina, that was amazing. Um, I just had a question. Did you correlate any of this to the cohort you might have a uh, history of medication, in particular dexamethasone? 
So we, from that database, they did not provide the steroid uh, data. So that would be a, a limitation in terms of assigning Rano criteria or modified Rano criteria, but it would be useful. Is there a way you could go back and get that? Because I think it'll take your study into the next level. Yes, I believe we, we can uh, request that data to the... So Gail, unfortunately, this is a limitation of using publicly available database because yes. you need to stick with what is available. The data there is not granular. Also, as you recall, Akrin is almost 10 years old, right? So some of the sequences there um, might be almost obsolete by now. Um, I, I want to congratulate Janina for her work over the year. She presented a, a very small fraction of what she has done. And um, we have another database that we just she just completed reviewing um, that is called the Lumiere database based um, in Bern. And in that database, uh, uh, the information is a little bit more granular and we have volumetric uh, studies. So uh, there is more to do. And then when we started working with this company, they were not FDA approved. They subsequently became FDA approved. So now we can use the software ourselves. And uh, we will have that uh, comparison that we would like to have with the clinical as well as the uh, dexamethasone. Nice, thank you. Well done. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to Mark Karbacek. I apologize if I got the name incorrectly. Um, Dr. Margetis is the faculty mentor. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Matt Karabajek, and I'm working as a research fellow in our department under the mentorship of Dr. Margetis. I have the pleasure today to present your research on utilizing machine learning for predicting in hospital outcomes for acute traumatic subdural hematoma patients. So we have no disclosures. So every year, 69 million individuals worldwide are impacted by TBI, acute traumatic subdural hematoma being one of the most prevalent and severe forms of TBI. Recognizing the global significance of TBI, numerous studies have used machine learning to predict outcomes. Most of these studies remain as feasibility studies, stating known facts about machine learning techniques and their potential advantages over traditional methods like regression-based models. Unfortunately, they fail to provide substantial advancements in the practical application of these models in a clinical setting. In response to this gap in the literature, our study's objective was twofold. Firstly, we developed a series of machine learning models to precisely predict adverse in-hospital outcomes following acute traumatic subdural hematoma. Secondly, we integrated these models into an open access web application to demonstrate their practical utility for individualized predictions. Our study in included adult patients diagnosed with isolated subdural hematomas identified by the relevant ICD-10 codes from the American College of Surgeons Trauma Quality Program database. The predictive variables were selected based on their availability in the database, and the primary outcome was in hospital mortality, while secondary outcomes included non-home discharge, prolonged length of stays, prolonged ICU stays, and major complications. More than 100,000 patients were included in the mortality analysis with a similar number for other outcomes, except for the prolonged ICU stays, as not every patient required ICU admission. So we split the data from 2019 to 2021 into training, validation, and test sets. We tackled the issue of class imbalance by implementing a widely used data balancing technique known as random sampling on the training set. We used lasso regression for future selection, retaining the futures with the highest predictive uh, power among other 100 variables. This slide shows the selected features for each outcome ranging from 11 to 16 per outcome, which I will not explain the details due to time restrictions. Uh, following feature selection, we utilize five diverse machine learning algorithms for each outcome, a transformer-based algorithm called TAP-PFN, a neural network-based algorithm called TAPNET, two gradient boosting frameworks, XGBoost and LightGBM, and the decision tree-based model random forest. Model selection based on the discriminatory abilities of the models evaluated through the area under the receiving operating characteristic curves. Top PFM models excelled in predicting mortality and major complications, like GBM in non-home discharge and prolonged ICU stays, and random forest in predicting prolonged length of stay. Each of these top performing models was subsequently integrated to our web application for each respective outcome, the details of which I will let 
uh, Dell later in the presentation. Uh, this slide offers performance metrics uh, for our selected models, which I will not explain in detail due to time restrictions. Again, we employed Shapley additive explanation to enhance our model's explainability, offering a global perspective on the most influential variables. Partial dependency plots were used to demonstrate the influence of individual variables on models predictions. This slide uh, displays a two-way PDP for mortality, illustrating the joint influence of age and total GCS score on the predicted risk, while the color gradient represents varying risk levels, highlighting the complex interaction between these two key parameters. The highlight of our study, a user-friendly web application allows users to acquire individual predictions. Here's our web application in action. So on the left, left side you can see the parameters and on the right side displays prediction and explanation fields so let's take an example and we could we click predict and get a probability with the default values then we click explain and receive sharp powered explanation of the prediction now let's change our parameters uh we can consider a six to seven year old patient with a GCS verbal score of four and a total GCS score of 13 with one reactive pupil, a large hematoma causing a midline shift uh, due to a motor vehicle accident. 30 seconds. Okay. Now let's assume we are in a level two trauma center with 500 bats. We click predict again. And we see that the mortality jumps up to 26% and we get different explanations for our prediction. Now let's summarize our findings. Firstly, our study's main contribution lies in creating an easily accessible web application, making it possible to transition our predictive models into clinical practice. These models with unprecedented accuracy have the potential to personalize prognosis for acute traumatic subdural hematoma patients, may serve tools as for risk stratification and also assist with quality insurance. Uh, thank you for listening to me. You can access the web application that I presented in this web, uh, this presentation by scanning the QR codes that is displayed on your screens right now. This is a really great study, and I think it illustrates how different trauma care can be depending on your proximity to a major center or, um, you know, perhaps a region, regional center. Do you, do you imagine that, um, you know, regional trauma centers or, or trauma networks might be able to use this data to help design how they get patients to their, um, to their flagships if they need higher level care? Yeah, yeah, of course, like uh, the only limitation is the availability of the data we have. If we have more data, we have a lot of more potential to improve triage, to improve, like uh, get even higher accuracy predictions. So it is uh, this kind of work has potential to be applied to any trauma setting or any neurosurgical disease setting. I mean, deciding which patient to put on a plane to a more a higher level center versus which patient to put in an ambulance to a lower level trauma center might be very relevant. Yeah, exactly. Were you including the images themselves in your uh, model uh, development or um, the details from the images? Uh, the, the database we use only have tabular data, but... Uh, if we have imaging, those can be incorporated as well to build a fully multi-model prediction model. Great. Very cool. Thank you very much. We'll move on to Jose Dominguez, who is mentored by Dr. Hooten. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jose Dominguez. I am a resident at Westchester Medical Center, New York Medical College. Uh, and I'm thankful to be uh, presenting here on this Mount Sinai Research Day, our work with um, thoracolumbar lumbar junction stenosis patients. Uh, we have uh, no disclosures. The general spinal stenosis of the lumbar and the cervical spine uh, represent uh, very familiar clinical entities uh, to neurosurgeons, specifically uh, the findings of myelopathy, uh, claudication, and uh, radiculopathy that can be seen. 
However, we can all remember uh, at least a few patients where uh, lumbar imaging uh, didn't really correlate with the classical uh, findings uh, that we see in the patients. Uh, one such entity that can produce these results uh, is thoracolumbar junction stenosis, where the compression in this case is the uh, epiconus, which is a region uh, just uh, cranial to the uh, conus nodularis. And this uh, produces a very perplexing uh, uh, list of symptoms that uh, have upper and lower motor neuron signs. Uh, it's been described uh, very uh, sparsely in the literature so far. In order to understand this uh, disease process a little better, we did a retrospective review of patients that underwent a decompression for spinal stenosis uh, from T10 uh, to L1. Uh, as we defined the thoracolumbar junction, uh, we looked at uh, 48 months of practice in three neurosurgeons and evaluated uh, several variables, including the Japanese Orthopedic Association uh, scale here, modified for the thoracic spine. Uh, to provide a quantitative measure. Of, within the time period, we found 1,069 patients that had surgery, and 31 of these patients uh, had surgery at thoracolumbar junction, uh, which uh, represents uh, the highest portion of the thoracic spine uh, that was seen. These patients had a minimum of 12 months uh, follow-up of surgery. As far as imaging, the patients uh, demonstrated uh, spinal cord signal change in 74% of cases. And most of these uh, patients, as you can see here, showed uh, spondylosis uh, as far as uh, changes of degeneration. Preoperatively, patients uh, had motor deficits and low extremity numbness in the vast majority of them. Uh, the detender reflexes here demonstrate a uh, lack of consistency when it comes to upper motor and lower motor neuron signs. A lot of these patients also had urinary dysfunction. It's also interesting to note that uh, 20 patients, which is greater than half of the patients, uh, had lumbar spine imaging uh, within a year uh, looking for uh, lumbar stenosis before a thoracic uh, image was uh, performed, and two had even undergone uh, lumbar laminectomies. Of note, the foot dorsiflexion was the most commonly affected uh, motor function. Postoperatively, after surgery, the patients uh, did well with improvement in gait and numbness. Uh, urinary dysfunction was less likely uh, to be resolved, uh, specifically as compared to gait and numbness. The th uh, Thoracic Japanese Orthopedic Association score did improve significantly pre to post op. However, those that had symptoms that were greater than one year uh, were less likely uh, to improve. And this is a list of the complications that we're seeing. The thoracolumbar junction uh, is an area that's prone to degeneration because it's a junction where the thoracic spine, which where is, uh, it's braced by the rib cage, meets a more uh, mobile lumbar spine. The uh, true thoracic uh, lumbar junction, however, is includes the T10 and T11 uh, segments because these are floating ribs, which are not fully braced uh, by the thoracic cage and include uh, L1 and L2, making it uh, the true transitional zone. This is a picture of a CT myelogram, uh, which uh, highlights the neural elements that are involved in thora thoracolumbar junction stenosis, specifically looking at myelomeres, which are uh, defined as segments of a spinal cord that give rise to specific nerve roots. In this case, the uh, myelomeres uh, that are next to the thoracolumbar junction happen to be uh, L4 and L5 nerve roots, uh, which give rise to dorsiflexion. Here's a very uh, beautiful artist's depiction here of uh, the myelomere specifically. Uh, this one highlighted in blue suggests the L5 nerve root uh, is coming out there in the epiconus, and compression in this area can be thought to produce this uh, foot dorsiflexion weakness uh, at a very high, relatively high level as compared to uh, what you traditionally see in the lumbar spine. 30 seconds. In conclusion, the thoracolumbar junction stenosis uh, clinical picture is uh, a perplexing one, uh, but surgical decompression can result in good outcomes, um, specifically when it is performed uh, in a timely fashion. The patients uh, can be misdiagnosed because of the uh, unclear findings and uh, we speculate that uh, part of the reason for the 
a large number of patients with dorsiflexion weakness was because of that specific anatomy of the myelomeres in the L5 and the epiconus region. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hooten, um, my mentor for this uh, presentation, and everybody here uh, for this, this opportunity. Thank you, Jose. Very nice. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay, we'll move on in that case to uh, Braxton Schultz, who was mentored by Dr. Kellner. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Braxton. I'm a second year uh, medical student here at Mount Sinai. Get that. There we go. And um, thank you all for coming to listen to my presentation today, talking about my project I did last summer, which was to investigate a um, novel model of intracerebral hemorrhage using neural organoids. So, whoops. There we go. Um, so intracerebral hemorrhage is a devastating subtype of stroke characterized by bleeding into the brain parenchyma, and it is associated with very high levels of neuroinflammation. Now, there are currently two major uh, ways that people study ICH preclinically. The first is through rat models, and the second is through two-dimensional cell culture models. Now, because there are current lack of treatment options available for ICH, um, we were thinking that that's potentially due to the fact that there are limitations with the current preclinical models used. For example, rats um, that are given ICH have lower mortality rates and faster recovery compared to humans, and uh, two-dimensional cell culture models react differently to inflammatory stimuli uh, compared to three-dimensional culture models. So, and it's problematic because we know that our brain is a three-dimensional structure. So we were then curious to see if we could use three-dimensional cultures, which uh, can be derived from human stem cells, aka an organoid, to help resolve some of these limitations. For example, we would no longer be dealing with the non-human problem, and we would no longer be dealing with the two-dimensional problem. And so we came across this company called Stem Farm, which has its own neural organoid platform, and um, we formed a research collaboration with them. And to grow their organoids, Stem Farm uh, starts with this hydrogel, which is like a jelly to hold all the cells together. And then over the course of 21 days, they add different cell types, such as neural progenitor cells, um, endothelial cells, mesenchymal stem cells, and microglia. And so then by day 21, the uh, organoids are ready for experimentation. Um, and it is important to have microglia in these cultures um, because we know that microglia plays such an important role in uh, neural inflammation. And so this brings us to our central question, which is can blood treated neural organoids then serve as a novel preclinical model for ICH neural inflammation? And to delve into this question, we started with a very simple preliminary experiment using the organoids. So the organoids were sent to us by Stem Farm. Here's a picture of one that I took, and they were divided into three treatment groups. Uh, the first one was a blood treatment group where they received between 0.6% and 10% blood diluted by volume in the cell culture media. The second group was an LPS group, which is served as a positive inflammatory control. And the third group was a negative control group, which did not receive treatment. And the treatments were for 24 hours. Then after the course of this 24 hour period, we collected the cell culture media and then used an ELISA to detect the pro-inflammatory marker IL-6. So if we saw more inflammation, we'd expect more IL-6 in the media. And here's the results of this preliminary experiment. So the y-axis is the full change in IL-6 compared to the negative control group. Um, and so this, the control group was uh, uh, controlled for standardized to a one. Um, and so you can see that across all the blood per, uh, the concentrations uh, and the LPS group, we had significant increases in IL-6 compared to the negative uh, control group. So this suggests to us that the blood is causing an inflammatory reaction in the organoids and could, these could potentially be used in the future for ICH modeling. Now, this is a very simple preliminary experiment. Um, we only looked at one cytokine. And so we did a follow-up experiment, one that is uh, more expensive and more uh, important. Um, and this is using single cell RNA sequencing for model validation. And so after we confirmed the results of the previous experiment, um, I took more organoids and I did the same thing. I treated them with blood for 24 hours. And then I, instead of cytokine analyses, I processed them for single cell RNA sequencing. Um, and for those who are unaware, single cell RNA sequencing allows you to look at the gene expression profiles of individual cells. So we'll be able to see how the individual neurons or microglia astrocytes are responding to the blood. And this is completed already. We actually just got the sequences back. So the next step will be to analyze them. But what's very interesting is that Dr. Kellner is able to follow a similar framework with some of his ICH patients. So he has this study called Clitomics, uh, which is a, uh, done in collaboration with the Russo's lab here at Sinai. 
And Dr. Kellner, for some of his ICH patients undergoing minimally invasive ICH evacuation, he's able to take a perihematomal brain biopsy. And this biopsy is then sent to the Russo's lab, which is able to isolate the microglia and perform single cell sequencing to then get the gene expression profiles of individual microglia. And this has been done already as well. There are upwards of 75 samples that have already been uh, put through this pipeline. So the next step will then be to compare the two. And this is the most important part of the project because it will allow us to validate the model system because we'll be able to directly compare the cells in the organoid in response to blood to human cell, uh, human brain cells that have also been response to, uh, responding to blood. And so this is the gold standard for validation. And so in summary, uh, the preliminary cytokine experiment revealed that neural, uh, neural organ, uh, organoids respond to blood stimulation. And uh, the next step will be to analyze the single cell data to assess the organoid molecular response and hopefully validate the model system. And this is significant because if we can validate the model system, we hope to potentially use it as a drug screening platform in the future for ICH neuroinflammatory treatments. And so I'd just like to briefly thank Dr. Kellner for all of his support. Uh, Jimmy Vicari, who's a member of the Russo Lab, who helped me on this project, the whole Russo Lab for all their support with the single cell sequencing and stem farm uh, for their uh, guidance with the organs. So thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, Braxton, and great work. Um, what do you think are some of the factors we'll have to take into account uh, with the human samples? that might affect um, the microglial response? So I think there are several things. I think um, one of the major questions that um, we need to kind of think about is how do individual patients respond to blood differently? So um, for example, you know, how severe their stroke is. Um, there are patients who have worse ICHs compared to others. Um, there are patients who might have different immune conditions that might affect their inflammatory response. So, you know, every patient is different in that sense. Um, I think one of the future things that we want to do is to be able to take organoids from IC or take uh, cells from ICH patients and then grow them into organoids. So then you could like control for some of those differences between people and see how maybe someone who has, you know, uh, a certain inflammatory condition or something that affects the immune system might have worse outcomes with the blood treatment. Um, so I think those are just several questions that we need to look at in the future. Yeah, thank you. Trevor? Hey, Braxton, this was an awesome, awesome presentation. This is great work. Um, I just had a question. Have you and, and Dr. Kellner thought about what components of the blood itself um, may be leading towards the pro-inflammatory response you are seeing in your organoid model with the the IL-6? Is it is it iron and leading with to, you know the cascade of ferroptosis that a lot of people have started to look at? I'm just wondering if there um, is a path to you know find what it is that you can then maybe have a, a treatment and look at some some options for that using your model. Yeah, so that's a great question. So. Um... Most of the two-dimensional models that have been done in the past have used either uh, heme or hemoglobin or hematin, I think they've also used. So they kind of started with the more like specific approach. They picked one and then went for it. Um, we decided to use whole blood because we weren't exactly sure which one is a more potent inducer. We just wanted to start to see, okay, could blood as a whole um, induce an inflammatory reaction? And so I think the next step, if we want to really narrow down the pathway, will be to choose one. Um, I think most people or most of the two-dimensional cultures I have used um, have used uh, heme. Um, and I, there is a paper out using organoids in a cerebral malaria model in which they used heme directly. Um, they didn't do single cell or anything like that, but they also saw an inflammatory reaction with just heme stimulation. So I think that's another, uh, like a direct route we could go if we wanted to pick something specific. Awesome. Thank you, Braxton. Thank you. We'll move Thank on you. to Jack Zhang, who was uh, mentored in Dr. Hajapanias' lab before he moved to Pittsburgh. Hey everyone. Hey everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jack. I'm a third year med student going to my scholarly year with the department. And I'm here to present my presentation on my project, Intracranial Convection Enhanced Delivery of Laponite Magnetic Nanoparticles. So, okay. So magnetic hyperthermia therapy is kind of what my project mainly focused on. It's usually, it's a, um, 
it's a thera therapeutic modality that's basically an anti-tumor treatment modality where you use magnetic nanoparticles and you inject them directly into the tumor bulk. So this is the overall workflow. The subject in our case is a mouse um, and exposed to an alternating magnetic field or AMF that is completely benign to the subject, but interacts and oscillates the nanoparticles in a way that uh, causes heat through friction and basically destroys the, the, the tumor cells in a variety of ways, including you know, DNA damage, mitochondrial damage, cytoskeletal uh, dysregulation. Uh, more specifically, my project focused on laponite, which is a synthetic uh, clay-like polymer that the, the nanoparticles were conjugated with. Um, it's capable of kind of magnifying the heat induction property. So it, it makes sense to see um, how this would kind of benefit the treatment modality. Um, my project was overall conducted in two phases. So the first phase was more of a safety, efficacy, viability phase. We wanted to pair it with a pre-existing technique called CED, which is... Uh, essentially uses a pressure generation, uh, a pressure gradient to uh, allow therapeutics to bypass the blood-brain barrier. So as you can see here, this is our um, kind of setup for this first phase where we had six mice that were immunocompetent. Uh, they were anesthetized, they were placed into a stereotactic frame, they had a burr hole drilled through their skull, and then they had 10 microliters of these nanoparticles injected into a predetermined part of their skull, uh, into their brain. And then for this next phase, um, this next stage we have here, um, we had two of these, sorry. Having a little difficulty. Okay. For this next phase, two of the six mice, um, the unlucky ones kind of had their brains, uh, they were immediately sacrificed post CED. So for this first one on the left, you see that we kind of turned their brain sections uh, into these frozen sections that were stained with Prussian blue that were uh, an amino stain that kind of shows iron deposition in the CED region. Um, the second one kind of more unglamorously had its brain removed and smushed. So this is for a direct visualization post-mortem of the nanoparticles. And you see here, they're nicely localized uh, where we injected them. And then finally, one of the mice, this mouse was a survivor and basically uh, went through a, a MRI 24 hours post-CED to show that the nanoparticles are once again localized where we injected them. In terms of the conclusion of phase one, we did a safety uh, measurement as well. So four of the remaining six mice that survived were observed daily. They were weighted, and we did not see any deficits in terms of mobility or aggression. Um, also reassuring, their weights continued to climb over the four weeks, which is a promising indicator for overall animal health. Now, phase two, this is more so the heating efficacy arm um, that was kind of uh, separate into an in vitro that would inform a later in vivo arm. So for this first phase, as you can see on the left, we have a couple different uh, permutations of different, different things we want to try. So we did the volume, three different volumes, two different concentrations, uh, a high and low magnetic field strength. This table on the right is kind of just a depiction of all the different uh, combinant, combinant metrics that we did um, together. So 12 different samples. And the things that we want to look at specifically in this phase were what the peak temperature was, how long it took to get there and how long it took for the particles to cool down. Obviously, we want to have very tight temporal control over a treatment modality like this. Um, so for this first in vitro phase, you see that the heating curve is quite robust. We were able to heat up to 49 degrees Celsius. The literature kind of suggests 40 to 44 to have like this anti-neoplastic effect. So we're right in that ballpark. Um, One minute. Uh, very happy about that. Additionally, uh, this kind of shaded area at 16 minutes is when we shut it off and we saw that the nanoparticles very quickly dropped back to baseline, which is also that tight temporal control that we were looking for. Um, in terms of the in vivo arm, so the top performing uh, combination of variables, as you can see, kind of circled in that box there, were injected into five new immunocompetent mice. Um, and um, they were then exposed to the AMF. As you can see, this is our setup. So the first part is generally unchanged. The second part is them in the coils for the AMF. And then this is the temperature probe going in. And then so for in this part, we unfortunately did not observe uh, significant heating intracranially. So I didn't show any of the data here. And there were some reasons as to why we thought this could be. Um, the, the primary one is we thought that maybe our stock nanoparticle solution wasn't adequately concentrated. So the literature says that these anti-neoplastic effects in animal models have kind of been seen in uh, nanoparticle uh, concentrations as low as 50 milligrams from ml. But when we did our Farinest assay to kind of quantify how much iron was in our nanoparticles, it came out to about eight. So, you know, obviously uh, much lower than the, the concentration that we need. Um, so that's something that we really want to work on moving forward is just to kind of work with the manufacturer to kind of uh, obtain a more uh, concentrated stock. 
Additionally, as you can see from our setup, it's not image guided or anything. So temperature probe is, you know, we tried to put it right through the burr hole, right where the, the uh, particles are going, but obviously it's not perfect either. And additionally, it could also be that the, the magnetic field is not hitting the nanoparticles uh, optimally um, because it is a very small volume in, in the skull. Um, so future directions are to address those two issues and see what we can get moving forward. But in summary, so lapinite nanoparticles, they demonstrate a robust heating profile that is promising anti-tumor applications, and they're also compatible with CED, which is a safe and effective means of delivering these particles intracranially. And so these are my references, and I would like to thank everybody involved with this project, Dr. H, um, the lab, as well as the, the, the TIMI uh, Imaging Institute that allowed us to conduct these experiments. Thank you, Jack. Do you have any questions for Jack? All right, I think we'll move on. Halima Tabani uh, will be presenting uh, a project that was mentored by Dr. Liang. Uh, I Halima, do you want us to show your slides? Yes, please. Thank Go you, ahead. Dr. Dr. Morgan. Um, my name is Halima. I'm one of the PGY3 residents here at Mount Sinai. And today I'll be talking about uh, our project on the time to evacuation and functional outcomes of patients who presented with uh, intracerebral hemorrhage uh, with fixed dilated pupils. Next slide. Uh, so to give a little bit of background, a non-traumatic ICH accounts for uh, about 10 to 15% of all stroke cases and has been shown to be um, correlated with a high mortality and morbidity rate. Um, and only 27% of the patients um, are functionally independent at 90 days. Um, there have been various grading systems that have been developed to characterize the severity and predict patient mortality. In patients with ICH, the most common one being the ICH score, um, which has shown that the higher the ICH score, the higher the rate of 30-day mortality. Next slide. Uh, assessing pupillary response is uh, an important part of any neurosurgical in, um, examination, and fixed and dilated pupils have been shown to be an indirect sign of transcentorial brain herniation. Um, there have been various studies that have looked into um, the prognostication uh, validity of fixed patients presenting with fixed eyelid pupils. And it has been shown that emergent surgical decompression um, is successful um, for survival and functional recovery in patients who present with unilateral fixed pupils. Um, however, um, having bilateral fixed pupils is considered to be an uh, indicated um, is considered to be um, indicative of poor functional recovery and mortality. And this was demonstrated um, recently in a study published um, in 2022, uh, where um, uh, de decompressive surgery was shown to have a favorable rate of recovery um, of around 17% patients who had presented with bilaterally fixed dilated pupils. Next slide. Um, so at our institution, um, uh, we have a centralized system to triage all patients who present uh, with ICH. It's um, known as DMAT, uh, and most of us are uh, familiar with it. Um, and it helps us to um, have a protocolized ma management protocol for identification of patients for inter-hospital transfers. Um, and all of our patients are triaged by a neurointensivist and neurosurgeon. Um, and the DMAT database is from where we uh, derive the data for this existing study. Next slide. So our objective was to investigate the clinical benefit and, of medical and surgical interventions in patients who are presented with fixed dilated pupils and were transferred over um, to uh, for the management of intracerebral hemorrhage. Next slide. We uh, the NEMA database is a prospectively da maintained database, but we did a retrospective uh, review of patients from uh, that database. We included patients who had presented with either unilateral or bilateral fixed dilated pupils uh, with supratentorial ICH with an ICH score of two to four. Um, and we included patients uh, who had presented between November 2018 to December 2021. 
Next slide. Um, our interventions included medical management, uh, including hyperosmolar therapy, uh, EVD, or surgical intervention, uh, either with um, minimally invasive scuba or a decompressive hemicrany. Uh, and our outcome measures included uh, mortality and functional status, which was uh, defined by MRS scores at 0, 30, and 90 days after discharge. Next slide. So we identified a total of 30 patients who met our um, inclusion criteria. Uh, about 60% of them had bilaterally fixed dilated pupils. Um, most of the patients uh, had uh, hyperosmolar therapy, including mannitol. Uh, about over 50% of them um, had an EVD placed, and 40% of them underwent surgery. Um, our average time to surgery was uh, almost 5.7 hours, and we had a 53% um, rate of in-hospital mortality. Next slide. Uh, looking further into the mortality rate, uh, we did not find uh, any uh, statistically significant correlation between the um, laterality of fixed dilated pupils, meaning it didn't. It, there was no correlation between the pupils being either bilaterally or unilaterally fixed and dilated, uh, and the rate of mortality. We did find a statistically significant correlation between the time to surgery um, and mortality. So. Um, but, but it did not, uh, on breaking it down by ICH score, we did not find any statistically significant correlation um, by those groups, um, most likely due to our small sample size. Next slide. Um, so looking uh, further into the factors that uh, were influencing the, the functional status, um, mo most of our patients did have uh, pupillary reversal after either mannitol or EVD placement but um, they, we did not find any um, statistically significant correlation between um, the, the pupillary reversal uh, and MRS at all these different time points um, at, after discharge. Um, we also did not find any statistically significant relationship between the uh, laterality of the uh, fixed dilated pupils and the MRS at 0, 30, or 90 days. Um, and then when looking at the surgical cohort, um, we can go to the next slide. Um, we had six patients who underwent surgical evacuation, um, and most of them had MRS uh, four to five at all time points, with the exception of one patient who died at 90 day follow up. Um, but again, given our small sample size, we did not find a significant association between the time to surgery and functional status uh, as measured by MRS uh, at any time point. So to um, conclude, um, the, the, this is the largest reported cohort of patients presenting with ICH um, with fixed eyelid pupils. Um, we re-demonstrated really that early surgical management is critical improvement clinical outcomes in patients with ICH. <coughs> um, we <coughs> don't think that <coughs> excuse me, uh, that fixed eyelid pupils are a universal prognostic indicator of mortality, but <coughs> time to intervention is the only um, a statistically significant um, factor that, that can help in improving the outcomes in these patients. And given our small sample size, we do believe that larger uh, studies with larger sample sizes and longer follow-up are needed to evaluate uh, factors that influence long-term uh, functional prognosis in patients with ICH. Um, next slide, uh, I would like to thank um, all the uh, faculty and medical students that helped on this project, and I'll be happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you, Halima. Do we have any questions? Hey, Halima. Hey, did you see any correlation between reactivity um, to mannitol and outcome or uh, to resp positive response to surgery? So we did not see any um, just, um, correlation between uh, pupillary reactivity after mannitol or EVD and outcomes, but we did see um, correlation between having surgical intervention and, um, uh, and mortality. But again, our, our sample size is small, so um, we can make limited conclusions based off of that. Okay, thank you, Alima. We'll move on to um, Bahi Ezat, who was mentored by Dr. Kelman. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Bahe Azad. I'm a first year medical student here at Sinai, and I'm part of Dr. Kellner's lab. And today I'm presenting my project on the association between antithrombotic 
therapy and outcomes of uh, minimally invasive endoscopic intracerebral hemorrhage evacuation. As you all know, uh, ICHs or intracerebral hemorrhages are the deadliest type of stroke. They have a one-year mortality of up to 54, uh, 54% and a long-term disability of 88%. Historically, randomized controlled trials have yielded negative results when it came to the surgical outcomes of ICH uh, for patients. However, more recently, and as recent as WNS 2023, the enriched trial showed that MIS evacuation of lower hemorrhages improves long-term outcomes for patients. And given that one third of patients are receiving or have a history of receiving antithrombotic AC or antiplatelet AP therapies upon ICH onset, uh, our objective in this study was to evaluate the impact of these uh, drugs on MIS for ICH outcomes, given these patients' potential for coagulopathies. And therefore, we conducted a retrospective study using electronic medical records of ICH patients who underwent this procedure at our institution between 2015 and 2022. We had our cohort split into multiple groups. We had a negative control of patients not receiving any therapies. We had an AP group, an AC group, and a combined AP-AC group, uh, including all patients on antithrombotic medications. We then conducted a univariate analysis to determine significant associations with P less than 0 0.05, and uh, decided to have a multivariate analysis controlling for age and MLA doses, given that literature showed that deep ICHs were associated uh, with older age and hypertension, as well as lower ICHs being associated with cerebral amyloid angiopathies. Here we present our demographics. Our antiplatelet group was of older age, had more incidence of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and diabetes. The anticoagulant group was not um, significantly different than the uh, control group in any of these uh, demographic variables. When we combined both groups together, however, all the variables that were significant in the AP group were still significant in the APAC group. However, ethnicity um, showed up as a new um, significant variable, which was interesting. In terms of uh, presentation characteristics of these patients, our antiplatelet group had higher GCS scores, uh, more lower ICHs. In terms of the AC group, they had a higher proportion of patients with ICH scores between two and five. They had more incidence of IVHs. And upon combining both groups, uh, the APAC group had a higher GCS score, more lower ICHs, and what was interesting was a lower NIHSS score. And finally, our um, clinical outcomes. So our AP group had larger postoperative hematoma volumes and lower evacuation percentages. Anticoagulant group had lower, uh, longer procedure uh, times and as well as lengthier ICU stays. Upon combining these two groups, the only variable that was significantly uh, different was larger uh, postoperative hematoma volumes. And these are all procedural uh, variables. So we also looked at long-term outcomes in terms of the 30-day mortality and MRS score at six months. And that was not significant between any of the groups. So we then decided to uh, go ahead and conduct a multivariate analysis. We initially, um, Included the GCS score of, of nine in the control group and, and 10 in the AP group was not clinically significant, so it wasn't part of our analysis. And we went ahead with our initial plan of uh, controlling for age and MLA doses. So the AP treatment was no longer a predictor of ICH depth, and the AC therapy uh, was determined, uh, was continued to sort of predict for uh, IVH occurrence. And um, here we present our conclusions. So antithrombotic therapies demonstrated a significant impact on procedural metrics. These included longer procedural times. Uh, lower evacuation percentages, larger postoperative hematoma volumes, and extended ICU stays. But in terms of long-term functional outcomes, um, as in the 30-day mortality and six months MRI score, uh, these patients did not have significant impacts on, on these outcomes. And our next steps are to uh, incorporate the rate of uh, antiplatelet and anticoagulant reversal uh, rates into our study. Uh, this is important because in 2016, the PATCH uh, study concluded that platelet transfusion seemed inferior to standard uh, care in terms of adverse, uh, adverse events and, and death uh, for patients taking uh, anticoagulants before ICHs. They also uh, did not recommend this uh, as an indication for clinical practice. So that's, that's our next step in terms of uh, including these stats into our study. Um, and here are my references, and I just wanted to thank you and thank Dr. Kellner and everybody at the lab for supporting me on this project, and I'm happy to take questions. Josani? Yeah, thank you. Um, what did you say you found surprising that came out being uh, significant? Um, so, or? 
Yeah. So upon yeah. So initially in our demographics analysis, uh, ethnicity was not a significant was not significantly difference between uh, the AP group and control as well as AC group and control. But when combining both groups, on uh, I guess having that larger um, number of patients uh, in in the analysis, uh, ethnicity was determined to be significant. And sorry, why do you find it surprising? Because it wasn't in the first. Two because it wasn't in the individual. Um, just because it wasn't in the individual. Uh, groups so do you know why this would happen um no we would definitely have to sort of look more into that and maybe include it in our, our next analysis. Okay, thank you thank you any other comments yeah that's that's definitely a surprising finding that ethnicity would impact the response to uh, antiplatelets or anticoagulants. Um, so uh, that's we're definitely going to have to dive into that data. Uh, another surprising finding was that the anticoagulant patients uh, had a higher incident of intraventricular hemorrhage. Um, but I think overall, you know, the the take home point is that the procedural metrics were worse for patients on either one of these, and it's uh, an ongoing area of debate how to manage these patients, whether you do take them at all or reverse them uh, or don't reverse them. Absolutely. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We'll move on to Brandon Philbrick, who was mentored by Dr. Shigematsu. All right. Uh... Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I'll be presenting on some work I did uh, looking at the Majik microcatheter for uh, pediatric embolizations that we do here at uh, Sinai. Just some background information. Um, neonatal and pediatric vascular malformations are, are quite rare, but they're often amenable to uh, endovascular interventions. Um, some of the nuances to pediatric uh, embolizations that include the, the overall smaller vasculature for, for young children, especially younger than five years old, and their, their increased risk for days of spasm. Uh, to embolize these malformations, um, we often employ the use of microcatheters um, to inject liquid embolic um, materials. However, uh, despite um, uh, us performing these endovascular embolizations, there are very few uh, FDA approved devices for use in pediatrics and in the IR setting. Um, one of the most common uh, microcatheters that's used for uh, pediatric embolizations in our institution is the Magic microcatheter made by Vault. That's a flow directed infusion catheter um, that's used for super selection of uh, um, uh, intracranial uh, vascular malformation feeders. Uh, it's one of the smallest microcatheters in the market for neurointervention, uh, and we, we often use it for our pediatric cases. However, uh, interestingly, the um, use for this microcatheter within uh, pediatric and, and neonatal use is actually listed as a contraindication to uh, the use of this catheter as published by the manufacturer. Uh, and in this, this study, I looked at the um, off-label use of this microcatheter for um, uh, for pediatric um, endovascular embolizations over, over the course of 23 years here. I performed a retrospective study using our cerebrovascular database to um, screen for cases, uh, embolization cases that use the uh, 1.2 French machine microcatheter at our institution uh, between 1999 and, and 2022. Um, okay. Overall, we were able to pull uh, 99 patients for a total of 194 cases. Um, almost all of the cases were vein of Galen malformations or, or pediatric um, ABMs uh, with, a, with a handful of dural AV fistulas and PLAV fistulas as well. Jumping into our data, the, the average age of the um, case that was uh, done in our institution was uh, four years old. Um, the, each uh, patient underwent an uh, average of just under two cases per, uh, per patient. Um, over 95% 90 per, uh, of the cases were embolizations. Um, some of them were dr uh, direct puncture sclerotherapies. And then um, we had a very small co cohort that used the Magic catheter uh, just for uh, diagnostic case. Um, almost all of them were trans arterial embolizations uh, with only uh, very few transvenous embolizations. Looking at the adjunct catheters that were used, um, most commonly instead of a guide catheter, uh, it was used uh, just a uh, angiography, a four French Berenstein angiography catheter was used as an adjunct catheter in these cases um, with a handful of um, the five and seven French envoy as 
um, uh, guide catheters in, in a minority of the cases. Almost all the cases use NBCA glue, um, with a couple cases using liquid coils. Some of these other uh, injectable liquid embolics are actually not compatible with the Magic catheter. So those, these were cases that use, utilized multiple types of uh, microcatheters during the case. Overall, looking at the uh, clinical outcome data from, from these patients and in, in patients that underwent embolization procedures, 100% of them had an interval of devascularization uh, as uh, dictated by the proceduralist. 90% uh, of the cases were, uh, went on to require further retreatment, which is, um, as we know, very common in, in these cases with complex uh, ADM. Um, we had 61 patients that had uh, follow-up data that was available for us to uh, look into. Uh, with an average follow-up um, time period of being 41 months. Uh, just under 50% of the, the um, children were neurologically intact on our most recent follow-up, and about 80% of them uh, were either intact or had very mild neurological uh, symptoms. Um, there were three mortalities over, our, um, uh, over the course of these, um, over the course of our study. Looking at the um, intraprocedural and paraprocedural uh, complications from um, from these interventions. Um, the, the most common um, uh, complication that we encountered was a vessel perforation during uh, manipulation of the microcatheter, and that occurred in three cases. Um, there was one case that had a, a delayed um, case of IVH at, uh, immediately after the embolization, and uh, that patient ultimately required having a VP shunt placed. Um, however, most of the um, cases of the intraprocedural complications, the uh, um, uh, patient went on to have a, uh, a full recovery. Um, just to, uh, bringing up a few discussion points from, from this study, uh, the study, despite the safety that we showed in this catheter and having very few complications over the course of uh, 194 embolizations, the catheter still isn't optimized in uh, length or mechanical properties to be used in neonates and children, and this could possibly lead to uh, complications. Um, some of the advantages of the Minji microcatheter is that it's non-bladed and it's flow-guided, which uh, allows for a very um, for a smaller selective catheterization as well as a um, more easily uh, navigable into the into the malformation. Um, some of the restrictions for this type of cath catheter is that it's non-DMSO uh, compatible, so we're not able to use materials like onyx to close larger fistulas or shunts in, in these patients. Uh, despite some of these restrictions, the Majig microcatheter has remained uh, the um, preferred microcatheter of choice at, at our institution for over two decades in treatment of vanogalin and, and pediatric ABM. Uh, just moving on to a couple of conclusions, um, with, uh, prop, we concluded that with proper training, the Majig catheter is overall uh, quite safe for use in pediatric embos, um, but the, co the complications may occur during uh, catheter manipulation, but they, they can be quite rare. Um, but overall, I think that this study kind of serves a purpose to, to demonstrate that there is a need for uh, development of uh, FDA-approved pediatric microcatheters for use in neurointervention. For um, uh, being aware that these are uh, uh, very difficult to organize clinical trials in, in uh, this group of uh, this group of patients, um, and we may have to uh, look at using compassionate use for uh, other FDA-approved catheters in, in these situations. Uh, I'd really like to thank my uh, mentors in this uh, project, specifically no, no. Dr. Shigematsu, as well as uh, Dr. Phoebe and Dr. Berenstein and, and uh, Max Basel, who's one of the uh, medical students who helped me with this project. I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Brandon. Do we have any questions? Dr. Zadek? Yeah, thank you. Do the cases get discussed in a multidisciplinary um, team before the decision is made for treatment? I can answer that. Yeah, we have a, uh, yeah, we, the, um, um, we have a, a go, ahead. go ahead, Brandon. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a large uh, pediatric cerebrovascular clinic um, where the, the patients mm -hmm. come through and then um, there are usually multiple attendings that discuss these uh, cases and are usually involved in the treatments for them. And do you decide this versus gamma for other non-surgical modalities at the same time? We discuss them all, um, but most of these patients are the vein of Galen babies. And when they're being treated in the first year, they usually have high output heart failure or other reasons that they need to be treated with a more rapidly. I see. I didn't understand. Rapid, rapid okay. Method. Yeah. But th these are mostly vein of Galen patients. Okay. 
correct Reno Galen. Half of the ABM, of course, it was a free up ABM as well included in this study. But yes, usually we do the much uh, we discuss with all the modality. And yes, for the pediatric, we try to avoid the radio surgery and then try to do the surgery. Yeah, that's very nice. And mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Job, yeah, that's an impressive that. number of cases. Mm -hmm. Brandon, I actually, think it's... Go ahead, Tom. Sorry. Actually, this is, this is still a preliminary um, result. We should be able to find and then uh, correct the numbers. And we have more cases, actually. Uh, it, it's going to be a very good study. I think this also shows the power, Brandon, of having such a high volume concentrated with in a few hands and using different technologies as the catheter technologies evolve, you know, we can really use the power of these numbers to compare uh, what we have available to us. All right, so we'll move, on. we'll move on to our next presenter, uh, Ronel Buzigo Torres, um, mentored by Dr. Hickman. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ronald Busio Torres. I'm a first year medical student here at Mount Sinai, and I'll be presenting the, the research that I've been working on with my team, also with my PI, Dr. Hickman, and it is titled Safety of Anticoagulation with Apixaban Following an Acute Traumatic Brain Injury, a Retrospective Case Series. Let's get into it. So many patients will need direct oral anticoagulants after having a TBI, TBI traumatic brain injury, whether because they were already on it, patients that have, may have a history of atrial fibrillation, for example, or need to start uh, anticoagulants due to a new thromboembolic complication that may happen in the hospital state. So patients that need anticoagulants after a TBI are at a higher risk of uh, having a new or worsening hemorrhage. And the, the physician is on a challenge, basically like balancing the, uh, the patient's current neurotrauma with the risk of thrombus formation because the patient needs to stop this medication after having TBI. And there's limited um, literature out there about the timeline of when it is uh, a good timeline to start uh, anticoagulation after TBI. And here's an, uh, a research that was published recently, 2021, Pocket et al. They showed that uh, starting anticoagulants from um, seven and nine and a half days after TBI reduced adverse event, but there's still a gap of knowledge and literature out there, like what is the optimal timeline to start anticoagulations after TBI and which one it is safer. So here in our research, we uh, the question that we wanted to, to answer is when it is safe to start a PIX event after TBI. And why a PIX event? A PIX event has been shown that I have a lower risk of intracranial hemorrhage. So that's why we used it in, in this study. And our objective is basically to examine the timeline to start a PIXABAN after TBI and record any complications. So our methodology, we basically did a retrospective case series from the Elmhurst Registry, uh, Elmhurst and Queens, New York, April 2016 uh, to December, 2021. And we basically, the screen process was, uh, we began with TBI patient records and with an AIS score uh, greater or equal to two, that basically it is uh, that the patient has a positive has CT scan. Then we screen for patients that had a, a Pixaban administration. And then we screen for only patients that use a Pixaban during the hospital stay. And we, at, at the end, we only included patients that had positive has CT scan. And we ended up with 10 patients for a case series. And we basically collected uh, the number of days after the TBI to start or resume a PIXABAN administrations and any related complications. So here we can see the patient demographics, mostly the, the patient demographics, the age, it was mostly elderly, and they had different reasons of starting anticoagulations. Um, half of them, they were already on anticoagulation on a PIXABAN uh, because they have a history of atrial fibrillation, while half of them, they started a, a PIXABAN um, 
because of different reasons during the hospital stay, like venous thrombosis and sinus thrombosis. And here we can see our results from the time from the uh, first st stable has CT scan to a fixed advanced start was about 6.9 days. Uh, the latest uh, radiological follow-up is about 35 days. And we reported no new hemorrhage or un unplanned neurosurgical intervention after starting a fixed event. And the mortality was of two patients, but both of these patients died uh, to sepsis after prolonged hospital stays unrelated to a fixed event administration. So here we have an example, patient number one, female in mid-60s, uh, suffered a subdural hematoma, had a pulmonary embolism on a mission, so that's why uh, needed uh, anticoagulation, and it started a PICS event in day 12. Here we can see the first CT scan. Here we can see the hemorrhage, and then the first uh, stable CT scan, uh, the last scan, before starting a PIX event and the latest scan as day 61. Here we can see that there's no new or worsening hemorrhage after starting a PIX event. So seconds. in this in, in this case series, we, we showed that start and resuming a PIX event administration relatively soon seems safe. And this study provides initial data for physicians to make decisions about when to start uh, direct anticoagulants to prevent any thrombus formations after TBI. And future prospective studies should focus on a larger sample size to elucidate the optimal timeline for st to start a PIX event after TBI. So that'll be it. And I would like to give thanks also to Dr. Himan, my PI, and everyone that worked in this project. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Okay, very nice work. Uh, we'll move on to our last of the oral presentations. That's um, Jeff Simmering presenting work that he did with Dr. Kellner. Hi, I'm Jeff. Uh, I'm a PGY6 neurosurgery resident. Uh, so WhatsApp is a widely used smartphone instant messenger application, which enables fast and effective communication. Last year, we reported on the perceptions of the strengths and weaknesses of WhatsApp amongst uh, members of the Mount Sinai Health System WhatsApp ICH provider group. Today, we report the results of an in-depth analysis at stored WhatsApp communications. Our goal was to identify significant predictors which could streamline care of the ICH patient. Many different surgical specialties use WhatsApp as a communications tool worldwide, yet few prior studies have tried to identify risk factors that are predictive of streamlined ICH patient care. The WhatsApp database we studied spanned a five-year period from 2016 to 2021. It involved cases referred to the Mount Sinai Health System hospitals, including Elmhurst. There were 149 cases. The primary outcome was time to patient disposition in which reduced time is synonymous with streamlined care. Based on the results of our survey, we identified 17 potential risk factors that might be associated with the primary outcome. These included specialty of the referring provider, experience level of the referring provider, whether actual imaging was provided as part of the communication, adequacy of the neurologic exam, which was judged by the receiving provider, number of providers that were involved in the case, number of text messages exchanged, and whether communication between providers was open or closed loop in nature. Closed loop communication means both referring and receiving provider teams agree upon a plan for patient disposition. We then used linear regression analysis to model the risk factors associated with time to patient disposition. The average time to initial response by the receiving provider was 4.6 minutes. The average time to disposition was 25.2 minutes. The mean number of texts per encounter was 16.4. On average, 3.7 persons were involved in each encounter. In 75, uh, 74% of cases, the consult resulted in transfer to another hospital. In 84% of cases, actual images were transmitted from the referring to the receiving provider team, and CTA was available for review in a similar 84% of cases. In only 43% of cases was the neurologic exam considered by the receiving providers to be adequate. An even lower percentage of cases, 28%, involved reporting of the NIHSS score. Communication between referring and recipient provider teams was characterized as having the hallmark of closed-loop communication in 66% of cases. 
This slide illustrates the distribution of specialties that made up the referring providers. In simple linear regression analysis, when actual imaging was available for review, when CTA was available, or when closed loop communication was evident, there was a highly statistically significant reduction in the time to patient disposition. Since CTA imaging and actual imaging were highly correlated, we next tested whether the two variables of closed loop and actual imaging available were independent predictors of time to patient disposition using a technique called multivariable regression analysis. Here we demonstrate that both closed loop communication and, actu and having actual images for review were both independent predictors of reduced time to patient disposition. In addition, closed loop communication and having actual images interacted significantly in predicting the time to patient disposition. In the next two slides, this interaction is illustrated graphically. So you can see here in this slide, each bar represents the mean and standard error for the four possible scenarios of neither images nor closed loop, actual images provided but no closed loop, closed loop without actual images or both images and closed loop. The largest number of cases, 78 here shown in gray, had both images for review and employed closed loop communication. When neither images nor closed loop communication was present, the mean time to disposition was 69 minutes. But when both images and closed loop were present, the mean disposition time was only 18 and a half minutes. The difference corresponds to a 72% reduction in time to patient disposition, which was highly statistically significant. So in our previous survey of ICH providers, WhatsApp was perceived as a hassle, which might contribute to alarm fatigue and provider burnout. Still, these results show that the main strength of WhatsApp is that it can significantly streamline care of the ICH patient when actual images are provided and there's closed loop communication. Here are my references, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jeff. Do you have any questions? Yeah, thanks a lot, Jeff. Um, I think uh, did you did you see in the data, or do you feel get a sense that we've improved over time as we've all gotten used to using this means of uh, communication? Have we gotten better at closing the loop, uh, or or does it seem like we've still got a long way to go? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it appeared that there was an improvement over time. However, we we haven't done the the actual statistical comparisons between between years yet, but that's something that uh, will be interesting to look at. Dr. Zadig? Yeah, thanks. That's really uh, fascinating, actually, to study it. So do you have various WhatsApp groups for different entities, different teams, different? Yeah, so oh, we, sorry, uh, where is I can't tell who's talking. <laughs> oh. Yes, yeah, so we have multiple WhatsApp groups um, by disease process. Um, there are several different uh, WhatsApp groups within the cerebrovascular group. Um, there's a, a neurocritical care communications WhatsApp uh, group. Uh, when I have recently surveyed um, members of our department, uh, the average number of groups that people were members of was 10, which uh, was was pretty mind boggling. And so we had we had looked at how this may be contributing to alarm fatigue, but uh, uh, it's definitely an area of interest, both uh, for for uh, well-being uh, and wellness of of our of our provider team members. Um, but also, we can see that it's an extremely effective tool. So, balancing that is uh, something that we're going to work on for the future. Very good, thank you. So that's that comes to the end of the um, longer form oral presentations. I want to thank all the presenters. Um, very nice job. Um, the next set of presentations is the brief poster presentations. A reminder, you'll have two minutes each to present your poster. Um, I'd also like to pause to thank um, Sukaina, Maggie, Sarah, and Jillian for all of the hard work that they did to prepare for research day. They did the majority of the heavy lifting, although I'm doing more of the talking. Um, but thank you, all of you, uh, for making it possible to get to this point today. And with that, we'll move on to the posters. So first up, we have um, Stavros Matsukas presenting his project with Dr. Margetis. 
Well, can you hear me well? Yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Savras Matsukas, a pre-residency fellow with uh, neurosurgery. So today I'm representing uh, our project regarding the exploration in the differences in radiologic and clinical outcomes for the TILIF cages, single planar expandable versus biplanar expandable cages. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis. Unfortunately, there's no comparative studies in the literature and no, no meta-analysis uh, right now. So we did a, a search the Embase and Medline uh, databases found 296 potential studies. 15 out of those were eligible for inclusion. Uh, there were um, 679 unit uni planar expandable cages that were placed from 12 studies and 199 uh, biplanar expandable cages uh, out of three studies. We primarily looked at fusion rates and subsidence rates and secondary outcomes included uh, BAS leg and back pain scores, ODI and reoperation rates. Uh, for stats, we used the R software. The metacon command was used for continuous variables and the metaprop command for proportions. Uh, we used random effects model with logic transformation in order to compute full outcomes with proportions. Uh, results wise, um, in terms of fusion, the, bi the biplanar expandable cages uh, achieved higher fusion rates compared to the uniplanar expandable cages, 97.5. Uh, percent versus 83.7 percent of P was significant. For subsidence, there was a trend for lower uh, subsidence rates in the biplanar expandable cages, but it was not significant. The VES legs that are mean of the difference and VES uh, back score and also reoperation rates were comparable between the two outcomes. Uh, the quality of evidence was assessed with uh, the grade. Uh, for fusion, it was assessed as low, and for all the other variables, uh, it was very low in the quality of evidence. Uh, for conclusions, um, there's lack of comparative reports in the literature. This study is not a direct, uh, is not a head-to-head -head comparison of uh, those cages. Uh, we found that the biplanar expandable cages may have higher fusion rates and a trend towards lower subsidence rates, but there is need for comparative studies in the literature. Okay. Thank you, Stavros. Do we have any questions? If not, we'll move on to Chile, who is presenting her project uh, with Dr. Hickman. Oh, she, uh, you're not showing your own slide. We're showing the, we're bringing up the posters for everyone. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chi. I'm one of the neurosurgery first year residents. And today I'll be presenting on behalf of my team of a systematic review and meta-analysis examining the association between acute alcohol intoxication and mortality following traumatic brain injury. As we know, TBI is one of the leading causes of deaths and up to half of TBI patients have been observed to be intoxicated at the time of injury. There's currently a lack of consensus in existing literature regarding the influence of alcohol on TBI outcomes, with possible protective effects observed in multiple large-scale studies. So our systematic review and meta-analysis was uh, looking at this association a little bit further. So from 2,681 relevant abstracts between inception and 2019 in two large databases, we identified 18 studies that met our inclusion criteria and conducted a meta-analysis using random effects models in R. So to summarize our findings, as seen on a figure one on the left, among approximately 60,000 patients with uh, alcohol use detected and 100,000 without, we found that the odds of mortality decreased by 26%, with a 95% confidence interval between 0.63 and 0.85 for patients who were intoxicated compared to those who were not at the time of injury. As seen at figure two on the right, we conducted further subgroup analysis stratified by mechanism of injury. And when examining patients with penetrating injury, uh, as seen at the bottom, we observe a similar association with an odds ratio of 0 0.75. However, when restricted to studies only looking at non-penetrating trauma, the association was no longer statistically significant with a 95% confidence interval of the odds ratio, including one. 
Does our finding suggest that the overall protective association of alcohol may be due to confounding by studies that include penetrating brain injury patients as evidenced by Simpson's paradox? To put this into context, um, previous studies have shown that penetrating Please injury patients are less likely to be intoxicated and yet more likely to have worse outcomes, which may drive the observed protective association of alcohol that was seen previously. However, future studies are still needed to further elucidate this association. And I just wanted to thank um, Dr. Hickman, Dr. Salgado Lopez, and Dr. Marguerite for their kind guidance of this project and the rest of my team as well. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chief. Do we have any questions? Okay, uh, we'll move on to Dr. Schuper. Now uh, it's Schuper who's presenting a project that he did with Dr. Steinberger. Thank you so much for your time. I'm Alex, I'm a PGY4 resident here. Um, in this multi-institutional study between Columbia and Mount Sinai, we assessed a group of patients with adult idiopathic scoliosis, which most deformity surgeons are, have a consensus is the sequelae of undiagnosed pediatric patients with adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. And what's previously been described by Dr. Linke is that these patients often have asymmetric pedicles, specifically at the apical levels on the concave side with smaller pedicles. This can be problematic from a surgical standpoint because these levels often need to be instrumented as they're under the most uh, biomechanical stress uh, during construct formation. So to assess this, we performed a CT confirmation study. We assessed 25 patients at Columbia of 75 screws in patients with type D pedicles, which are pedicles that have an absent, can absent cancellous channel, and to understand the trajectory and the safe way to place these screws, which are a little unconventional. Um, in this cohort, we found that these screws are often placed ventral and medial compared to a more conventional uh, transpedicular screw. Um, in addition, we wanted to assess the biomechanical forces of these screws compared to our standard transpedicular screw. So. Um, along with the help of Dr. Margetis, we used three cadaveric specimen. And as you can see from the AP radiograph in the center of the screen, we compared transpedicular versus juxpedicular screws. And using insertional torque and plus strength metrics, found that there was around a two third value of the juxpedicular screws compared to conventional transpedicular screws. So, in conclusion, we found that freehand juxpedicular screws are safe to place in type D pedicles in patients with adult idiopathic scoliosis, and that while ju juxtapedicular screws aren't as strong as traditional transpedicular screws, they do confer roughly two thirds of the biomechanical advantage compared to transpedicular screws. Thank you. Alex, I have a question. Are these, um, what about the safety of these screws? Is the complication rate similar, high or lower? Unfortunately, we don't have the numbers to really suss that out. Um, in the original series published by Columbia a couple of years prior to this paper, um, there were no major complications um, in terms of nerve injury or spinal cord injury. If you can think about it, it's almost safer because it's more of a lateral trajectory. You're further from the spinal cord and in some cases, you even further from the nerve root um, with the ventral medial entry compared to conventional screws. So they found that it was pretty safe. Uh, these studies were all done freehand. Navigation wasn't used for any of these screws. Um, however, there haven't been enough patients to really assess this. Interesting. Okay. Um, we'll move on to our next presenter, who is um, Avi, Avi Bimani, uh, mentored also by Dr. Margetis. Hi, um, I'm Avi. I'm the PG by four uh, resident. Uh, in the department. I uh, wanted to talk about the ultra early surgery for thoracic spinal cord injury, um, uh, the endeavor in the project with Dr. Margueras. Uh, the study included our, um, our in house sample of uh, a series at the Elmer's Hospital, as well as uh, uh, analysis of four other studies in the literature um, for uh, early decompression of spinal cord. Uh, thoracic spinal cord injury. So uh, overall, there has still been contentious debate in the field about the timing of um, decompression with the spinal cord injury, with most people agreeing timing uh, decompression within 24 hours, but a lot of the uh, clinicians arguing about much earlier decompression to reduce secondary inflammatory cascade and improve outcomes. So in our meta-analysis, uh, we were able to uh, um, stratify the patients into two groups. So the ones operated on within eight hours of uh, 
uh, injury and the ones operated on after eight hours. Um, we were able to identify 133 total patients from five studies and uh, performed the both um, arm-based meta-analysis uh, um, as well as well as uh, comparative treatment effect uh, uh, and standardized uh, mean difference analysis as well. And in our analysis, uh, we treated uh, uh, AIS score as a continuous variable, which each with each AIS representing a subsequent increase in a numerical value, uh, where we found a significant uh, improvement in uh, in the Asia in the Asia score um, for uh, groups that were operated on within eight hours, as as opposed to groups that were operated on after eight hours of injury, and uh, um, individualistic. Uh, individual um, um, statistical analysis for those studies also also showed that the treatment effect of the studies less than uh, studies with decompression in less than eight hours was quite significant where there was no significant treatment effect uh, um, in patients uh, who were decompressed after eight hours and uh, there was a, a significant effect difference between the two groups. So in conclusion, uh, we observed a significant um, improvement in the mean Asia score in patients undergoing decompression within eight hours of spinal cord injury and toward understanding this largest, uh, um, you know, this, uh, this medal analysis includes the largest sample of population in this, uh, uh, in this pathology that is published. Thank you, Avi. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to uh, Noah Nichols, who had a project with Dr. Panoff. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Noah, I'm one of the PGY2s. Um, so it is common for patients with medically refractory epilepsy that's extra temporal and MRI negative to undergo intracranial EEG for seizure localization. Historically, this has been done with subdural grids and strips. Um, however, that's associated with a relatively high rate of hemorrhagic complications ranging from 3 to 14%, depending on the study that you reference. Um, most epilepsy surgeons have now transitioned to using SEG alone for seizure localization, but herein we aim to describe the morbidity profile of um, hybrid implantation in which subdural grid strips as well as depth electrodes are used. So this is... Um, a retrospective review of consecutive patients who underwent hybrid implantation over a little over a decade. Uh, we looked at outcomes uh, ranging from hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic complications, neurologic deficits, length of monitoring, as well as number of electrodes placed. The study included 137 patients. The majority of them were male and the majority of them underwent implantation on the dominant hemisphere. There are a total of seven uh, hemorrhagic complications as correlated with a hemorrhagic rate of roughly 5%. All of these um, hemorrhages were extra axial and they were all symptomatic in the form of either new aphasia or new um, contralateral weakness. Um, fortunately, seizure uh, focuses were localized in the vast majority of patients, 95%. 97% ultimately underwent uh, recessive surgery versus VNS. There was a slight trend towards uh, longer EMU stays for patients with hemorrhagic complications, or this didn't fully reach significance. Otherwise, hemorrhagic complications were not associated with the number of depth electrodes, the number of electrode contacts, um, laterality, or even prior uh, cranial surgery. Because all of the hemorrhages were symptomatic, they did require a take back to the OR. Uh, the mean take back time was uh, 3.4 days after surgery. Uh, and all neurologic deficits uh, that resulted from uh, hemorrhages fully resolved after clot evacuation. Uh, most importantly, our study did show that with increasing experience and case volume, you could significantly reduce the rate of um, hemorrhagic complications over time. So in conclusion, uh, the hybrid implantation method is a safe um, and reliable way to both localize seizures as well as um, reduce uh, hemorrhagic complication. Thank you, Noah. Do we have any questions? Okay, thank you. I uh, will move on to Richard Shun uh, project with Dr. Jenkins. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Richard. I'm an incoming medical student, and today I'll be presenting an illustrative case on the OC fusion of a patient with hypermobile ehlers stanlos syndrome and a retroflex dilated process variant of Eagle syndrome. So Eagle syndrome is traditionally defined as an elongated stylet process that causes symptoms of neuropa neuropathic and vascular compression. Um, recently, a study of 27 patients saw a jugular variant where an anterior projecting stylet process is actually retroflect, causing stenosis of the internal jugular vein and the sympathetic chain. The traditional stylodectomy approach to treat Eagle syndrome fails to consider patients with HADS and craniocervical instability causing this compression. Therefore, in our clinic, we saw a 36-year-old male, pa male patient who presented with a history of HEDS, craniocervical instability, as well as thoracic outlet syndrome, causing a normally normal length style process of around 27 to 28 millimeters to actually be retroflexed and compressed on these vascular structures. Um, four years preoperatively, the patient endured symptoms of neck pain, vertigo, and head, and tinnitus, and ultimately improved from cervical immobilization via a heart collar. Therefore, we proceeded with an O to C1 fusion procedure. Um, in the pre-op and post-op, 15-month post-op x-rays, we can see that adequate or uh, excellent fusion was achieved between the OC1 levels, as well as um, substantial decompression was shown between the style of process and the Siemens transverse, uh, transverse processes. Um, ultimately, this, the patient reported significant improvement in both their pain and symptoms at the 15-month post-op mark going from a 9 to 3 out of 10 pain, complete resolution of his neck pain, as well as improvement in frequency and severity of his vertigo, headaches, and tinnitus. For his long-term neurovascular symptoms, as well as, as his residual pain, we attribute that to the chronic compression um, of these vascular structures, as well as um, his other conditions, such as TOS. Therefore, in conclusion, we, pr we propose that an O to C infusion may actually be better indicated in patients over um, over a stylectomy in patients with um, HEDS and what we call a reverse Eagle syndrome. And this is given the dual purpose of stabilizing the, the OC junction while also decompressing this sympathetic jugular complex. Thank you. Okay, uh, do we have any questions for Richard? Thank you. With that, we'll move on to Travis Ladner presenting another project from Dr. Margetis' group. Hi, uh, Travis. I'm a PGY7 in the department. Uh, this is a short study with Dr. Margetis on the use of a bidirectional expandable T-lift cage for open fusions. Uh, this is a, a cage that both expands in height as well as width um, when, when uh, performing a T-lift. Uh, the advantage uh, is that you could put a a smaller cage in that you can then expand to a greater height and a greater width to improve um, the, the height of the neural foramen as well as um, the surface area for fusion. Uh, so we looked at uh, a, a single arm uh, retrospective consecutive series of 26 patients that Dr. Margetis performed on open T lifts uh, with a bi directional expandable cage. Uh, we looked at clinical outcomes, we looked at radiographic outcomes, uh, summarized uh, here. Uh, we, uh, in total, operated on 26 patients. Uh, we placed 41 cages. The mean follow-up was around six months. A few patients didn't have follow-up imaging, so they were excluded from the study. Uh, overall, we found that 95% uh, of patients uh, achieved effusion, 12% uh, required reoperation. Uh, one was for a pseudoarthrosis, and one was for an infection. Uh, we looked at um, the baseline um, disc heights before, immediately after, and then at last follow-up. Um, from surgery, uh, we found um, after performing uh, t tests that there is a statistical increase in the the disc height, both in the anterior portion of the disc and the posterior portion of the disc, uh, immediately after surgery, and also um, at about six months follow up. Uh, we also looked at the foraminal height, basically the distance from pedicle to pedicle at the uh, index uh, operative level. Uh, there is a trend toward the foraminal height increasing immediately after surgery. Um, but this um, decreased uh, to uh, not significant at, at last follow-up, but um, not, not certainly not reduced. And then finally, we looked at the overall lumbar lordosis as well as the segmental lordosis for the index operated T-lift level. And we found that that was uh, essentially um, unchanged and the lordosis of the patients was maintained before and after surgery. Um, in this uh, the short study, we found that uh, using this uh, device was, was, was safe. Uh, patients had good outcomes. Uh, we do want to um, compare this to a, a group that only had a um, 
a static cage placed by the same surgeon at the same hospital. We also want to um, have additional um, radiologists review the uh, the x-rays uh, to determine interregular reliability of the, these radiographic uh, measures that we perform. So that, that process is, uh, is ongoing and will be in the final manuscript. Thank you. Any questions? I have one question. Sure. Um, it's a nice study. Uh, did you have an estimation or did you look at the subsidence rates? Uh, not included here. We we, uh, we only had one issue of subsidence. Okay. One, one patient had a subsidence and a serothrosis and required a revision. So that kind of accounts for that 5% on fusion rate. Thank nice. you. Moving on to the next one, Devarshi, mentored by Dr. Kellner. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Devarshi Vasa. I'm a first year medical student, and my research mentor is Dr. Kellner. Uh, today, I'll be discussing the association between stress hyperglycemia and post operative outcomes after a minimally invasive ICH evacuation. Uh, so for some quick background, uh, stress hyperglycemia is a phenomenon where blood glucose is elevated above baseline after stressful health events such as myocardial infarction or intracerebral hemorrhage. And this has been linked to poor functional outcomes after ICH. Um, and while traditionally elevated fasting blood glucose levels have been, a, been the marker for stress hyperglycemia, this marker does not account for background blood glucose levels. Um, therefore, recent studies have started to use a ratio of blood glucose to hemoglobin A1c as a proxy for stress hyperglycemia, which has demonstrated greater discriminative power in predicting poor functional outcomes uh, compared to using glucose alone. Um, and so in this study, we aim to investigate whether preoperative glucose to hemoglobin A1c ratio is a predictor of postoperative outcomes in patients who have undergone minimally invasive ICH evacuation. Um, and for the study, we had a cohort of 192 patients who underwent minimally, minimally invasive ev evacuation. And similar to previous studies, a preoperative glucose to hemoglobin A1C ratio greater than the median was considered to be stress hyperglycemia. Um, so here in the first table, um, age, gender, ethnicity, hypertension status, and hyperlipidemia were not significantly different between patients who had stress hyperglycemia and those that did not. Uh, however, patients with stress hyperglycemia were more likely to have a history of diabetes. Um, a, and, and after that, uh, a multivariate analysis was then done uh, while controlling for variables that have been previously found to be significant predictors of post-operative outcomes. Um, and in doing so, an elevated glucose to hemoglobin A1C ratio was found to be strongly associated with ICU length of stay with an odds ratio of 2.43. Um, furthermore, it was found that using serum glucose alone was not associated with ICU length of stay when controlling for the same variables, um, which again just corroborates the increased discriminative power that comes from using the glucose to hemoglobin A1C ratio over uh, serum glucose alone. Um, so overall, uh, using a marker that provides better predictive value for ICU length of stay may guide further clinician expectations of recovery and guide management of patients after uh, minimally invasive ICH evacuation. Um, and that's my presentation. Thank you everyone for listening. Thanks, Devarshi. Anyone have any questions? Okay, we'll move on to the next presentation. Emily, who is Emily Chapman, who is mentored by Dr. Hickman. You all see my screen? Yep. Okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Uh, Emily Chapman. I'm one of the first year residents um, in neurosurgery. And uh, yes, my mentor is uh, Dr. Kavinos and Dr. Hickman. Um, today I'll be talking about um, recent efforts uh, with our team at Elmhurst to devise a neurosciences specific BT risk assessment uh, model. Uh, the, the background for this study is that, you know, as, as, as we all know, um, weighing the relative risks of, of thrombosis and hemorrhage uh, is a hot uh, topic of debate uh, for post-surgical patients as well as um, non-surgically managed patients in general. Um, and as of today, uh, there's still, there's still a, a decent amount of, um, of, uh, of debate on uh, what is appropriate for um, specifically neurological and neurosurgical patients. And so our aim was to create a workflow and uh, protocol that uh, uh, specifically uh, focused on, as you can see in this um, flow chart here, on the one hand, um, non-surgically managed neurological patients, and, and then also on the right, surgically managed patients. 
Um, to this end, we um, undertook a systematic review of the literature. And uh, it's important to note here that we um, referred to a previously validated um, improved score criteria, which is a pretty uh, a quick way to, to devise um, uh, thrombotic risk as well as hemorrhagic risk. Um, more specifically, um, for, for the VTE risk assessment, IMPROVE um, has these, these stratifications of very low, low, moderate, high risk, and very high risk. Um, the very low is, is like less than 0.5%. Um, the very high is, is greater than or equal to 7%. So thankfully, um, low overall, but still it's important to have these stratifications. And then the improved um, hemorrhagic version um, it, uh, is, a, is more of a bimodal um, low versus high. So essentially we went through the, the literature. Um, we looked at, uh, again, uh, studies that compared um, uh, the, uh, the natural progress of these, of these uh, thrombotic risks. Um, and then we were um, able to uh, find the, the sort of validated um, AC uh, protocols for these and to sort of uh, uh, categorize these patients into these different subtypes. Um, so as you can see here, again, this is a, a busy um, uh, flow, flow chart that requires more work, but you can see that everything is divided up by um, different uh, disease types. And uh, this is sort of uh, the hope is to devise a, um, a, a pathology specific uh, protocol for AC. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Do we have any questions? Okay. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for participating today. I, I think this really highlights all of the incredible work that's being done in and adjacent to this department. Um, you've really all done a tremendous amount of work to produce these presentations and thank you to all of your mentors for your commitment to training and teaching our students and residents. So I'm going to take a few minutes to present some awards, um, share my screen. Dr. Vetterson is in a meeting with the Dean, so he cannot present the awards today. But, uh, sorry, if any, everyone can mute. <laughs> okay, um, so the, the Kalman Post Neurosurgery Resident Publication Award is an award that was established uh, by Dr. Post's Family Foundation um, to reward resident productivity. Uh, the intent was to acknowledge and promote excellence in scholarship by our residents, and I think it's done so um, as the residents have been increasingly productive over the years. Um, a selection committee reviews the publications by the residents from the previous year and determines the uh, recip awards recipient uh, to be awarded today on Neurosurgery, Resident Research, Neurosurgery Research Day. Um, you know, we view this really as a, a tribute to Dr. Post's commitment to academic excellence and, and also his commitment to the residents' uh, training and, and really fostering their, their growth and development as young neurosurgeons. Um, so this year's award, I'm um, proud to announce, goes to Alex Schuber uh, for his paper, Sex and Racial Disparity in the Outcome of Aneurysmal Subarachnoid Hemorrhage in the United States, a 20-year analysis. This was published um, recently in Stroke. Uh, he had help from some a number of his colleagues, uh, including Trevor and Kurt, one of our recent graduates, and was mentored by the vascular team, including Dr. DeLacy, Fifi, Mako, and Majidi. Um, so congratulations, Alex, and nice work. And I hope that all of you see this as an opportunity to up your game for next year. And then we'll move on. Um, there are two awards to be, um, two additional awards to be given today uh, for the research day presentations. Uh, obviously you all did great work and um, a committee, just for a little background on how this was how all of these selections were made, but there was a committee of faculty who scored all of your um, all of your work fairly rigorously using a grading rubric, and we ranked all of them. And the top presentations were given that extra, the longer form time at the beginning, and were considered considered for the research awards today. Um, so we have a second place and first place research day awards. The second place was a a, a tie today. So Brandon and Mert for their outstanding work. Uh, Brandon, for his paper, uh, a single center 23 year experience with a magic catheter for pediatric AVM and Mert for his um, machine learning project, looking into um, 
in hospital outcomes in acute traumatic subdural hematoma using this web application. Um, so nice work to both of you. And then first place today, um, you know, very clearly to us, went to Trevor Hardigan for his work in IL-3 maintaining post-stroke hematopoietic response in the chronic phase of recovery. Um, this is not to reduce the value of anyone else's presentations. You all have done outstanding work, um, but to sort of elevate some of the top some of the top from today. So thank you, everyone. Um, and lastly, thank you to Dr. Zade for making the trip. Um, your busy schedule, it's a pleasure to have you today. Your talk was um, illuminating and inspiring. And uh, thank you for surveying our residents and students work today as well. Thank you, Peter. Can I just say that the uh, I put it in the chat, but just to emphasize it uh, verbally, that the body of work presented is really amazing. It's tough to, as you said, select uh, awards from it. Uh, everybody's doing amazing research. It's a wealth of research, really impressive and noteworthy of how much work is being done on vascular neuro uh, disease entities. Um, and just really thank you very much for the opportunity to listen to the breadth of work that's being done at Mount Sinai. All right. Thank you, everyone, uh, for another successful research day, and we'll see you next week at Grand Rounds. Bye-bye.